professionally wing this chat. <laughs> wing it. Wing it while we know what we're doing. Yep. And we'll go live. I believe I've pushed the live button. Uh, yes. yes. People are filling in. So. Hello, people oh, are yes, coming in. Of course, the chat there boxes. And... There we go. There they are. The chat Just... boxes and bits. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, participants. <clears throat> All right, I'll the poll. Tom, hi, Eddie. Mr. Holmes. Uh, so yes, first call of action. Has Mr. Bickerton made it into the webinar? He yes, has. he has. Yes, he is there. That's all. That's all's going on in the Discord. Okay. Well done. Well done, Tom. Oh, gosh. Hopefully, Tom has watched part one. I, I see John here. His name disappeared <laughs> on, the, uh, on the attendees list here. Mm. I've just realised you've all disappeared Jay, off my screen. Jay, Jay, you're there at the moment. I thought he was playing um, Ghost Recon or something. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> well, I'm going to get on with the poll while you guys introduce yourselves. Okay, right. Um, we'll all give it a, give it a few. We'll give it another minute or two and then we'll get everyone started. Um, okay. But hi, everyone. It's Paul Meenan. Um, guys, introduce yourself. Go on. Dave. What? Well, normally I'm after JW. So Mr. JW. Oh, okay. Well, hello. I'm JW, as you probably already know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Dave Watts, aka Spark and Ninja. Hello. Um, and I'm Paul Scum. Hey. There we go. Introduction is done. Um, so for everyone watching this, this is a continuation of the first one we did. Hopefully, you've all watched it on YouTube. If you haven't, we'll give you a little bit of a re refresh. Um, but what we have tried to do in this part two is listen to a couple of the YouTube comments. So those in the YouTube comments, we have tried to listen to you and expand on one or two little bill, little things that might wet your whistle for another future podcast or webinar where we can go into it in more detail. Um, we were, I think it's fair to say, when we started doing uh, talking about webinars, we were looking at five or six and I've got about 30 listed yeah. down now. So this list keeps growing. Um, and that's got a very scale. that's got very little of anything to do with the amendment two of seven six seven one, which is even more crazy. No. So <laughs> there's, there's, that. there's that little thing as well coming in the future. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that amendment two. Yes, March, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we'll have to expect so everybody we'll to be marketing their wears maybe. for it. We'll squeeze something in. Yeah, we've got enough to do, haven't we? Yeah. Well, it's March. It's uh, a few months away, so we'll deal with that uh, when it arrives. Okay, I think we should start. Um, you guys and if anyone on. joins, I'll let's just, just get on with it. I'm just working on the pop. Whew. Okay, right, everybody. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is part two of this original webinar. We split it into half so that we could have enough time to do it a qualitative approach. Um, this was written by myself as a way of showing how I learnt the electricity work regs and compared them to their six pages of chapter 13 in bsm 6 m one it's i suppose you could call it a way of memory mapping or you know i don't know whatever term you want to call it but i call it memory mapping um so for those who weren't here last week very simply um if you have a copy of the big blue book very simply if you open up to chapter 13 what i did in my chapter 13 was i took a pen and i know you can't see this so i apologize but basically on the left hand column you'd write all the numbers that you think are the corresponding electricity at work regs and if anybody doesn't have a copy of electricity at work regs um, just go online and download hsr 25 which is this thoroughly used blue covered acop and this is the guidance on the legislation and we'll go into what legislation is in a second as well so welcome everybody let me just see if my computer works now and i can advance the slides we've done our introductions that's us yep. um mm -hmm. the key thing to remember in all of this is the ability to defend yourself. I know I'm a Street Fighter fan, I'm a man of the 90s, what can you do? Um, but one of the key things in anything we do as far as selection and erection is having the ability to defend ourselves. It's the one regulation as a, an asset manager now, or even if I am on the tools doing works, is am I doing enough to be able to defend myself in a court of law? Uh, Mr. Skirm, you've got a little bit of experience with this sort of stuff, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've done a little bit of expert witness stuff and, and um, investigations and what have you. And um, I know some of the risk assessments and assessments that I've done have been used as evidence. So, and it's really important we remember this magical number 29. Um, it, it's actually kind of one of the weirdest numbers I tell anyone in any apprentice to learn first is your defense in a court of law. Um, know your defense and build backwards almost, to be honest with you, because you, you will be on an amazing 
journey of arguments and rounds on sites from the amount of electricians I've worked with that don't necessarily know this enough because we concentrate on the lower numbers, the 12 to 15s, which is kind of what we're taught consistently on the courses, which are great because they're relevant to the job. But there's some other bits that may help uh, form an additional invisible tool in our toolboxes. Um, just before we get back into this, um, everybody, we will do the Q&As at the end, unless John, who's going to watch the Q&A box, says, Paul, there's a good question. Let's answer it now. Um, but generally, there is a, a few absolutes within the Electricity at Work regulations. Um, they are on the screen for you. Regulation 4.4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now, the reason we pick them out from the 33 regulations are in the document is they are absolutes. They are ones that you will do regardless of cost. They are shalls. And the very key word here is, um, or the terms that you'll read in the document is practicable or reasonably practicable. And reasonably practicable is that balance of time, cost and money. If it's practicable, it means it's practical to do it. You shall do it. And the easy way of remembering this very quickly without under, without having to go and memorize time, cost, risk, triangles and all that malarkey is just look for the word shall. Get a highlighter pen, go through the book where it says shall, you're doing it. I just um, ask, can I ask a question? On this? Certainly. Sorry. Maybe, maybe Mr. Scrum can kind of help highlight it. When, when, about... <laughs> when we talk about money, as, yeah. as in they're thrown in there. Are we talking about money? Is it, oh, we don't want to have that in our planning for this financial year? Or as in this kind of money will break the business, we don't have the money. What kind of money are we talking about here? Well, um, there's, there's two ways of looking at this. One, every large business, every large corporate business will have a price on a life. Hmm. That would be a board level decision. And that would be the sort of money that they will be prepared to, or they would expect to fork out in the event of a, of a death on site that they, they are culpable for. Um, the other one then is, um, you know, uh, it's going to break the business. Well, okay, but you've got to put measures in place to plan for that. And the other one takes me back to when I was doing my first NEBOSH general certificate course. I was taught by the guy that used to be the health and safety union, health and safety officer at Ford Bridge End Engine Plant. And he said to me, one good way of looking at it is if you're going to injure somebody uh, and you're going to use the practicable or reasonably practicable excuse uh, around money, think of which body part you're going to injure and think how much that body part weighs in paper money. And that's how much you should be spending to rectify that mistake. So okay. if you're going to give somebody a black fingernail and it's going to cost a million pounds to prevent it, you ain't going to be hauled at the court. No. If you're going to kill somebody and you could have cured the problem for a thousand pounds, you better get a good brief and like <clears throat> get, and think about soap on a rope. Mm -hmm. it, Cause um, <clears throat> it kind of links to something I've had experience with in the food industry where there's always after the end of a year, many incidences of persons losing the end of a fingertip, you know, and the penalties and the process, you know, the penalties and the financial penalties that are burdened upon the companies weren't really sufficient to make impact for the nature of the business. They, they wouldn't learn from that yeah, yeah. penalty. And I believe, is it the corporate manslaughter act or something that was updated recently to try to kind of really knuckle down on this kind of problem sometimes? They are. HSC have changed the, 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 the finding methods now and they've changed the way they look at these things. I mean, you've got fees for intervention now, so they'll be charged for, Visits, they'll be charged for reports from HSC mm. and they'll be charged for the investigations and all that sort of stuff that are done by health safety executive. Mm. And they will also be charged, uh, sorry, they will also be fined based on their global turnover. Yeah. So if you've got a small local um, uh, division of, like, you might, the, the UK might have the smallest division of the company in the world. Um, it could be, you know, 0.1 percent of the global turnover, but they could have an accident there, and that division could be fined based on the company's global turnover. Yeah. So they could conceivably be fined millions of pounds for a for an accident that could easily make the business insolvent. Mm. So, but this is the sort of thing with the large companies. This is the trying to do to hit the large corporate pocket. 
because these companies should have the money. They should have put this right. Um, yeah. But they need to learn from this, don't they? They don't need. They, do. they, they should just go. Oh, that's another one. That's another one, and we can it's, just offset that. Into a simpler context is trying to differentiate between commercial, industrial, and domestic. Yes, there are different penalties. There are different ways of considering guilt, liabilities, mm. etc. But so, for instance, if I go to work, and I'm going to make an alteration to an electrical installation that has no earth, then I am. I'm going to be liable if I go ahead and make that alteration and I don't redress the earthing. Why? Because I can't certify to seven, that it's compliant 76M1, uh, 13216, and I also can't say that I've complied with electricity at work regulations while making the alteration addition. In a domestic house, it's slightly different because the, the liability, the duty is on you as the select director. The, the client, I know a lot of the industry bodies like to say, yeah, 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 put it onto the client. That's fine. But what you'll end up with is electricians issuing danger notification forms. Now, the, the, the guy who's doing that selection direction really should be following those fundamental principles of understanding and ascertaining uh, whether the equipment is fit for the alteration. But we will go into that because I don't want to get stuck on this. Yeah, let's yeah. push on to your thing. Right. So your yeah. defence, in any proceeding for an offence consisting of a contravention of those past regs, it shall, notice the word shall, be a defence for any person, doesn't matter whether you're employed, uh, self-employed, etc., to prove that he, which is a bit sexist, they took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid the commission of the offence. I get asked loads of times, what is due diligence? And I always say one thing, do the bloody work. Research it, understand it, learn it so that you know what you're applying. Um, and then in English, there's a bit of a, a bit more guidance in the HSR. And it says regulation 29 only applies in criminal proceedings because by that time you're in you're in trouble. Mm. But it does provide a defence for a duty holder who can establish they took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing offence. Now, if we watch the asset management webinar that I did a couple of years ago with Dave, I said to you guys that when I first joined London Underground, there was no earthing and bonding on any of the stations. So I had to discharge my duty of care to tell London Underground that just because part of them were under the ground, it didn't mean they'd done earthing and bonding correctly and they hadn't considered the risks or hazards. Um, long story short, the minute that due diligence went in, the money got found. Amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, when you when you when you when you are copying in and writing these emails, folks, if it's a non-domestic client, find out who the health and safety advisor and park it at their doorstep. Because the minute they get guilty knowledge of that, they have to do something, which means in theory, doing a job correctly, you'll make good money. Um, this is something new. So we had a comment on the first video about um, what was legislation, laws, directives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I, I very much like to use visual guides for stuff. Um, some people will know this as maybe an interpretation of Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, I like to call this Paul's visual triangle, the hierarchy of legislation. Um, so the way I've always understood, and this is more complex than this, but this is just a visual principle to, as an engineer, what do I follow when I am at work? So I know the EU directives. Paul, do you want to tell us something about the directives of the, of the EU? Muted, mate. Un unmute yourself. The uh, these are things like the low voltage directive. Sorry, I muted myself because I was coughing. Um, the low voltage directive, um, the machinery directive, the the work equipment directive. Mm -hmm. uh, these these sort of uh, high level European mm -hmm. legislation that have been enacted into UK law, which they are Europe wide. The the guiding principles they're not they don't give you massive levels of detail they're goal setting they give you goals that you must meet such as the the, the big two for us really if we're manufacturing or installing and that sort of stuff is the Royal Voltage Directive and the Machinery Directive and they've got essential health and safety requirements that are that are broad brush it. and if you read the essential health and safety requirements of the Low Voltage Directive they will look very similar to something we see regularly or something that's in BS 7671. In other words, you mustn't kill people or harm them. You mustn't harm livestock or kill it. And you mustn't harm property, whether that be through electric or heat. Yeah, Basically, that's one of them. No, um, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and just for everyone listening and watching, if it's on YouTube or not, the, the key term is the directives. You have EMC directives, medical directives, machinery yeah, directives, low voltage directives. They are pretty much the highest laws in Europe. I know we voted out of Europe, but that doesn't seem to affect anything until the government replaced them with something. 
think there's uh, about 70 directives in total. Seven yeah. zero. So we have replaced C mark. Well, we're about to replace C marking with C A marking. End um, of next year. Yeah, but um, I don't think there's any major changes. And recently, I've used the directives um, to interpret various things, and it's I found them really intuitive and real plain English common sense stuff. So from a hierarchy perspective, if I'm doing anything on a railway, first of all, I'll look at LV directive, machinery directive. I'll then look at UK acts. So the Health and Safety at Work Act, the Equality Act. OK, these are two key top level pieces of legislation. Um, Health and Safety at Work Act will have a section three that requires an employer to provide a safe workplace plant and equipment, etc. Now, I've always said that when I did my first knee Bosch, um, one of the guys it did a brilliant interpretation. He was a scaffolder and he basically turned around and said, look, nobody really reads the Health and Safety at Work Act. And because they don't read it correctly or they need more interpretation, it created secondary legislation. And, and the electricity at work regulations are regulations under that act. So I have seen prosecutions of electrical contractors where the the OOR or the uh, HSE inspectors have gone in and have gone statutory breach of regulation eight, which is then a statutory breach of regulation three. And they always go for the higher law. They'll just use the regulations as a stepping stone, which is why you don't really see that many heavy duty publicized this person breached the AWR because there's always something above it to prosecute which leads to higher fines um below that i always then look to harmonize documents now fancy word but basically it's bsen standards um is there any bsen standards that covers the remit in the subject a little bit more when you step outside of 7671 um bsen 62305 partner protection european harmonized standard um once we've gone through them, we then look at British Standard 76M1, which is kind of the minimum baseline we work from. And I always tuck underneath that is all the interpretation, the guidance notes one to eight from the IET. And then under that, you then have electrical safety first guidance, the code breakers, the on-site guides and, and all these other things that you would term best practice. That's just how I would translate that to someone who was grilling or interpreting me. One other point with the harmonized documents is that um, everybody links BS 7671 to the out of state work regs uh, yeah. because of that Will Willie statement in the front, uh, in the given by the health safety executive. Yeah. When it comes to harmonized standards uh, and the EU directives, there is a much more rigid link. The EU directives state that if you meet the harmonized documents and you comply with the relevant clauses, you will meet. The requirements of the essential health and safety requirements of the, the the needs of the essential health and safety requirements in the directive so um that means basically follow the product standard and you will meet the essential health and safety requirements if you don't follow the product standard you're off on your own justify it yourself a bit like a deviation in 7671 mm. and in those product standards it will say this standard will meet will help will help you meet the following essential health and safety requirements by meeting these clauses. So there's a much stronger link there between the directives and the harmonised documents than there is between British standard and the secondary acts. Before I move on from this slide, I just want everyone looking at it to think of one thing: if you are going to choose to depart from a clause in seven six seven one, which is fine. Um, what else are you looking at to inform your decision? Are you looking above and below? Are you looking at all the guidance around the subject matter? Are you looking at a European uh, or BSEN standard, which does apply in Britain as well? Um, are you looking at secondary acts? Are you looking at EU directives for more guidance? That's the due diligence. Now, obviously, a lot of this may not apply to people in domestic dwellings, but domestic dwellings are getting far, far smarter, far more intelligent. The smart home guys, uh, you know, will be leaps and bounds ahead of this sort of interpretation. So just worth thinking about when you're making uh, design decisions and selection direction decisions. One last thing I'm going to add is, um, ironically, uh, is the top three are all free. So everything that you can be prosecuted under, EAWR, Health and Safety at Work Act, all the EU directives are fully free to download. They don't cost you a penny, but if you don't follow them, could cost you everything. I just okay. pressed a link to the Low Voltage Directive page on the EU website in Thank English in, in the chat. Now, one of the things you guys are also thinking is, is great. So everything else like harmonised documents, British stands and guidance note are a fortune. So to comply with the intent of the laws, you have to pay a fortune. But to, to get the law, it's absolutely free. 
personally, and I've said this before, they should all be free at the end of the day. All of them should be, but that's just my own personal opinion. And ignorance right. of the law is no defence. Now, just before we get back into it, this is what, a little task I wanted to show everybody that I do at work. So what I do is when I take a subject like uh, EICRs um, and I write a scope of work, I will translate that triangle and give it a little bit more granularity as to how I expect it to be interpreted. So for me, in this, the top of my triangle is the input is electricity at work regs on the left. The output is duties of electrical safety in all workplaces, employees, employers. Um, below that, then the national standard for electrical installation, 7671, the output is an electrical installation condition report. Below that is the guidance from the IET, specifically for inspection and testing ICRs GN3. Below that, you then got your NAPIT, your NIC, your ESF, SIBSI, DFT, OOR, best practice, all the other stuff that helps underpin your decision making and your, your risk profiling. So this is the sort of stuff I map to just ensure I'm not going bonkers in what I'm asking of my supply chain. So, yeah. Right. Let's get back into this. Dave, you're going to start. One, on. three, before two point nine. Before you move on, there was a there was a chat comment by Eddie. So it's not a question. It's a chat comment about the the deviations. And he said, how you know, surely you would go higher for your deviations if you're going to deviate from from the standard. How hard, you know, how I'm Eddie, can adding you that. Explain that a little bit more in the chat. So yeah. departures from seven six seven one or deviating from the law. I tell mm. you what, Eddie, do you want to put it in as a question and we'll come back to it at the end? Yes. So we can address it properly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Have a think about it, Eddie, and put some text in. Thank you. Right. Right. Dave. One three two. Yes. Point nine. All right, so we're carrying on where we were from the last one, moving into the design parts. So we were at one three two design. We, yep. One three two dot nine emergency control. An interrupting device shall be installed in such a way it can be easily recognized and effectively and rapidly operated. Where in a case of danger, there may there is a necessity for immediate interruption of the supply. Yep. Okay. So what do we think? This is under emergency control. What regulation do we think? And let's take a punt at this, boys. Um, we'll do a poll as we did last time, but we're not going to do it for every single one. Um, I'm personally, go on, guys, you tell me what number you, I'll give you five seconds. Well, means for cutting off the supply for isolation is regulation 12. So I would look further at that to see the depth of that guidance. Oh, by the way, they haven't read these numbers in this presentation, so I'm just teasing them oh, I um so okay so regulation 12 so regulation 12 electricity work rigs what does it say okay uh subject to paragraph uh three when necessary to prevent danger suitable means including where appropriate methods of identifying a circuit will be available for cutting off supply of electrical energy to any electrical equipment and isolation of any electrical equipment in the first paragraph isolation means disconnection and separation of the electrical equipment from every source of energy in such a way that this disconnection is and separation is secure. And to the first paragraph, it should not apply to electrical equipment, which is itself a source of energy, but in case, in such a case as is necessary, precautions will be taken to prevent, so far as reasonably practicable, danger. So it reasonably practicable there one, isn't it? So it's interesting that the uh, definition of isolation, that's the first part of the AWI I've memorized. Yeah. The definition of isolation, because it's it's a good thing for sparks to memorize and sense check themselves on. Mm. Um, also there's there's other things that, that you could put for this it's not just necessarily one as we covered in the last um, part one webinar um, you could apply four here all systems should be constructed to you know as far as practical danger um, shall be maintained uh, maintenance regime number four and equipment provided should be suitable for its use systems work activities and protective equipment that's also another one you could throw in the ring uh, Mr. Ward. Right, this is uh, carrying with the design. So 132.10, disconnecting devices. Uh, disconnecting devices shall be provided, so you will be putting them in, so as to permit switching and or isolation of the electrical installation, circuits or individual items of equipment as required for operation, inspection, testing, fault detection, maintenance and repair. What do we think there, boys? Mm. Are we going we gonna to play snap? Okay. Yeah, back, just catching the voices again. It is definitely. Um, it does. It does get repeated a bit, but again, it's twelve, exact same as before. Disconnection and separation of every source of electrical energy in such a way that it's secure. So we're going mm. into the world of prosumer now. So yeah. battery storage, <clears throat> solar PV. Do we have isolators? I've had lots of rows with uh, solar inverter companies where they basically the little DC plugs. 
they deem them suitable and sufficient to act as DC isolation. And uh, what Paul does, I sit there and go, no, 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 that's absolutely not. So I have the grey and black DC isolators for the mechanical isolation. And on the AC side, I have the red and yellow isolators as well. Um, I've had a few debates on that in my time. Again, same thing with isolation. It's a 12 and 4 every day of the week. Um, Mr. Skirm, can you do 13211? He's muted. When he unmutes. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay. 132 design still. Uh, mm -hmm. 132.11. 132.11. Yeah. Prevention of mutual detrimental influence. The electrical installation shall, another shall, be arranged in such a way that no mutual detrimental influence will occur between electrical installations and non electrical installations. Electromagnetic interference shall be taken into account. There's another shall there. EM interference shall be taken into account. So what do we okay. think, guys? I'm going to run a poll. Yeah, it's a good, good one for a poll, this one. To a poll. So for those watching on YouTube, apologies. We can't screen record the polls. Um, I just don't think it's physically practical to do it and make this make any sense. <laughs> no, so, we'll just, we'll just, we'll, yeah, I mean, the, just just for just so that people on YouTube know, the polls consist of options of a list of regulation numbers from the electricity work rigs. So the regulations 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 29, and 30. Hmm. So they have an option of those, which are the ones relevant to our chat today. Now, if everybody remembers <clears> last <throat> week, what was that common number that kept coming up again and again and again? I'll See, my, my eyes, I'm opening the thing. My eyes are going straight to us as well. I mean, I can look at others and go, maybe, but I keep going back to that someone, one that kept coming back last time. changed their mind. Are they? Yeah. Good, good. Oh, by the way, just to add to this as well, um, this is my interpretation with, obviously, my friends here. Um, your interpretation may be different, and that's fine, because at the end of the day, your defence is your defence in the court of law. This is just about us chewing the fat, trying to stimulate yeah. the conversation. And, and please... together. Don't just say I disagree. Let us know what you think. And we may even think about things similar once you explain it from your different angle or your different opinion. You know, it's an, opportunity for us to, it's an opportunity for us to learn as well. If you have a good, you know, good opinion, we will take that in and it will help us as well. Can everyone please vote? Because only six of you have done it and there's come loads on, more of you. Come on, vote, because I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Get voted in, guys. Come on. And then we're going to end the poll. There's a comment from um, Mark Holmes, which says that are these isolating and disconnection devices allowed to be auto resetting? And the answer is no. You can get devices which like sort of auto reclosing things, but if it's going to be something that's put there so you can actually lock it off and disconnect it, then no, it's not something that's going to be uh, auto reclosing and switching it on while someone's working on it. And if you're looking at domestic stuff, particularly, Things like RCDs, which can reset themselves, are not permitted for use in domestic installations. So uh, that's that one. I've ended the poll and I'm sharing the results. And 44% of people, can everyone see this by the way? Yep, I see. 44% um, of everybody has said regulation six, 22% regulation five, 22% regulation four, and some regulation 12, which Interesting. Okay, so everyone's gone for adverse and have hazardous environments. So let's see what we put in here. And this is where I think I'm going to hang on. There we go. So I put five. But you know what? I think this one definitely is actually a five or six. It's, this is the thing. My eyes went straight to strength capability, but it's just as mm. strong to hazardous, hazardous environments. Um, so there's a number you could consider with this. Depends on your interpretation of what the, the the actual thing you're thinking at the time yeah i i, I do you know what for everyone who's done that um hmm. yeah five or six absolutely go to to be honest with you i, I mean i i did pick one number just because of the first thing that came to my mind some of them are a little bit more um but yeah five or six i'll go with that i think that's very robust five and six are basically twin brothers anyway pretty much aren't they yeah i mean fundamentally the same the regulations are about mutual detrimental influence, and in our in our mind, that's about the capability and strength of the system with regards to the hazardous environment you may put it in. So it's really blending the two together. Mm, that's a good one. Right, I'm going to close this poll now. Thank you, everybody. Right, we'll move on. If my computer works, 
Excellent design and it's me. Oh yeah, okay, 13212, accessibility of electrical equipment. Electrical equipment shall be arranged to provide one, sufficient space for the initial installation and latter replacement of individual items of electrical equipment. Uh, and two, accessibility for operation, inspection, testing, fault detection, maintenance and repair. Accessibility, what do we think? What's everybody thinking? Put numbers in the comments if you want, even. Well, it's, it's there straight oh, away. I've put, there you go, I've put you the button. Sorry, I've accidentally tapped the button, apologies. It. But it's there straight away, 15, working space, access and lighting. It is. And also, I was talking about this earlier on, actually. If you look in HSR 25, there is a section in the back in Appendix 1 that talks about working space and access and historical um, space constrictions. And it actually talks about um, in front of low pressure, uh, seven foot high and a width of uh, three foot away from bare conductors. And if anybody wants to know more about space clearances and stuff, uh, Bizria do a document called uh, the Bizria Rules of Thumb. It's used by commercial and industrial design houses to look at access gantries, walkways, etc. They are a minimum, by the way, not the go to. They're a minimum. I was looking at them today and I think one of the access walkways was like 750 mil. And I was yeah. like, not for me, it ain't. Yeah. So I was like, right. If you're, not, two, please. if you're not familiar with Bizria, is it B-S-R-I-A, isn't it? No, B-I-S-R-A-R-I-A, Bizria. B-I-S? Yeah. Yeah. Bizria. Um, so there we go, Bizria. Oh, no, B... Oh. Yes, Bizria. Google it. Sorry, I, I literally finished work half an hour ago. There we go, so B-S-R-I-A. It's one of those things go. that it's just, yeah. John Ward's put a link in, and we'll put a link in yeah. the video as well so that you yeah. can... You can find it. But yeah, so accessibility of electrical equipment, regulation 15, working space, access and lighting for the purpose of enabling injury to be prevented. Adequate working space, adequate means of access and adequate lighting shall be provided to all electrical equipment on which or near which work is being done in circumstances which may give rise to danger. Um, this falls very quickly into confined spaces in the domestic we took we did a podcast and confined richard. spaces in lofts and stuff with richard yeah with so, richard yeah go back and listen to that it's a very good podcast it's yeah it is it's it opened my <laughs> eyes actually i didn't i didn't think of lofts it, as a confined space but. it's it's the same though in principle we always look at we always look at it for the training perspective of people going under the ground where there's risk of gas leakage you know we always look at the way it's presented to us instead of thinking about the actual aspects of the science of what a confined space with restricted movement really is Thank you, John, for sharing that. Next one, Dave. Yo, okay. Um, 13213, documentation for the electrical installation. Every installation shall be provided with appropriate documentation, including that required by regulations 313.1, 514.9, 536.5, part six, and part seven where applicable. Yep. Now, this is a shall, and how many domestic installations <laughs> have any of those things? Uh, some commercials don't either. Yeah, lots of them. Lots of them. It's one of the biggest problems, pre-construction information, records, and also records that you can have confidence in. This is why I like some of the new online certification systems that allow you to put photos in the documents and stuff. So when you're issuing certificates, there's photos and... But even this regulation, right? It's not, it's not mentioned here, but if you go to, for example, Chapter 56, Safety Services, there's a whole list of information that's required for safety services, which are very often missing. You know? Mm -hmm. So what do we think regulation number wise? Should we do a poll on this one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, why not? Um, let's relaunch the poll. Hopefully everybody sees this that. Will, this will be interesting because, you know, it's there's nothing here that says diagrams or anything that's obvious. So it's a bit of thinking now. Yeah, I, I actually, on commercial industrial, I designed my switch gear now so that I have a, a spare compartment that has all the laminate drawings in some lock-off kits in, uh, touch-up paint, stuff like that, a safe, mm. sealed compartment, um, just so that the guys have got half a chance in hell of having some quality records. Touch-up paint. Um, wow. Reg 15 just now. I mean, if you look at Section 729 in BSM 671 as well, we've got operating and maintenance gangways, mm -hmm. which gives yeah, us some do. guidance on dimensions and stuff as well. Yep. That's from the old Factories Act, those figures, I believe. Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, pass, that, the passing width and the, and the switch room distances yeah. and stuff. The yeah. reason I've raised that was because I've been on many a, many a job where people have argued over what's the minimum space in front of electrical equipment. And I've had so many people go, mm. well, there isn't anything defined anywhere. And I've had to go, oh, hang on a minute. There's the Bizra stuff. There's the Appendix 1 stuff. I had, 
I had the same situation with an aggregates company recently that installed air conditioning onto panels just to help with obviously creating a zero pressure in the room due to dust. But it made the passing width significantly narrower within mm. the panels. It was this huge thing. It was like, it was like a, a surface mounted thing. It did a great job in cleaning the thing, but the passing width was gone. Okay. Right. Well, How are we closed, doing? Everybody's answered. Pass closed. What have we got? Oh, cool. Okay. So regulation four, five, or 15. So I will share our unit. I think it's a four, to be honest with you. If we go into it, if you look at, um, where are we now? Sorry, my eyesight's going again. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, maintenance, as far as necessary to prevent danger. Also shall be maintained, so as far as reasonably practical to prevent danger. Um, every work activity, use of use of main, use and maintenance of system and work near a system should be carried out in a manner not to give rise. How do you do that? You need documentation. Information. You need yeah. information. Yeah. Think about how how you going to avoid how you going to avoid danger without information. How you going to assess risk without information. How you going to plan without information. Or for be oh. properly used. How are you going to use it properly without information? Right. So that's why it's systems. It's systems of work. It's all built fundamentally on knowledge, and that's from information. And, and, and it's not just when it when when we talk about use in these things, these standards and, and this legislation, we're not just talking about use by the end user. Use covers maintenance, modification, repair, mm. and use by the end user. And that's what mm. people forget. Oh, it's not use, it's maintenance. Mm, it's use. Mm -hmm. Maintenance is use in the legislation. Yeah, if you don't have records and stuff, you're not gonna you're gonna struggle to comply with parts of this without a doubt. Because, and if you if you're in a workplace and the employer uh, doesn't have the records, look at it as an opportunity as an electrical contractor to make money to go in and do surveys, EICRs, create the records that are missing for them. I spent about a year of my life at BOC factories on the North Circular in Edmonton. Yeah, and we had to survey every single nook and cranny and wire and create all the block diagrams, full EICR, full equipment schedules, the lot. Um, raised thousands of defects as you can imagine from decades mm. of changes but but again it's good money the more you can learn the more information you can give the more information yep. you can give the more value you can offer yeah you know you know you have a contractor going oh what's the previous contractor done and there's this archive of information that next contractor is either going to kind of have to kind of try to compete with that or they're going to show a very poor performance in offering to match it yep you know and they'll come back to you one thing I will say, though, is make sure you've got proper insurance to cover you if you start giving professional advice. <laughs> yeah, indemnities. And uh, I'm, not, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, trying to look out for the for you people rather than just, uh, you know, right, crack on. on. Yeah. Okay. Next. Who's it? John, next. It's me, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, 132.14.1, protected devices and switches, a single pole fuse switch or circuit breaker, Shall be inserted in the line conductor only. So no switching the neutral and leaving the rest of the installation energized and in a dangerous condition. Mm -hmm. So what do we think, everyone? Um, I'm not going to poll this one. I think I used 11, which was means for protecting from excess of current. John? Yeah, I think that's uh, fine. So efficient means suitably located, shall be provided for protecting from excessive current every part of a system as may be necessary to prevent danger. So if you're going to switch it off, if you put it in the neutral, it's not going to prevent danger yeah. because it's going to switch off, but all of the thing is still going to be live and potentially dangerous for someone who uh, didn't expect that. It's interesting, this one, John, as well, because this, this is very similar to the early references of fusing in the earlier editions of the regs that we've been looking at. There was more and more as the regulations changed to fuse parts of the installation down. So it's amazing that it's kind of just worked its way into here. But yeah, number 11. Right. Uh, next one, Paul. Okay, so 132.14.2, protective devices and switches. No switch or circuit breaker except where linked or fuse shall be inserted in an earth neutral conductor. Any linked switch or linked circuit breaker inserted in an earth neutral conductor shall be arranged to break all the related line conductors. So we're talking about earth neutral conductors. We're talking about pen conductors. Yeah. Um, TNC system. Um, 
CNE conductor is the other one we're using it, combined neutral earth conductor, pen protective earth neutral. So uh, what do we think? Well, I have gone back to play snap and I've gone back to number 11. Mm. Means of protect from excess of current. Efficient means, super located, shall be provided for protecting from excess of current every part of the system. You could go with 12 as well. <laughs> Means yep. for cutting off the supply and for isolation. Yeah. Um, you know, cutting off the supply of electrical energy. Um, you know, if you're going to disconnect the earth, then you're, you're moving, you're removing a safety feature as well. So you could even argue eight. Yeah. Because you're removing eight, and you? Yeah. It's interesting you say that because this is one of the big challenges I had when I was squiggling in my chapter 13, the relevant electricity at work reg. I was writing more than one. And then I'd go back and reread it and go, no, no, what's the first one? Because otherwise this will be a three-part webinar. Um, <laughs> but this is about the principle of just mapping the two. Yes. But yes, I don't, I don't disagree. There's no wrong answers here. No, there aren't. Um, back to, back to this, carry on with design 132 UK specific reg. Um, for those who may not know, if it's 201, it, it's UK uh, specific. Um, no switch or circuit breaker, except where linked. Or fuse shall be inserted in an earthed neutral conductor. Any linked switch or linked circuit breaker inserted in an earth neutral conductor shall be arranged to break all the related line conductors. Oh dear. So what do we think? Should we do a poll on this one? Do a poll. It'll be interesting to see what people think if they think about this with overcurrent protection for eleven or twelve, or go back to. There's a lot of mention here about poll, earth everyone. It's with launched. eight. So go with the one that is it's one option to so go with the one that you most strongly think of here. Is this an issue more to do with the ability to turn off earth? You know, with eight, or is it more a case of okay, overcurrent protection with eleven? It's interesting the earth neutral conductor now, isn't it, really? Given all the stuff we're seeing with diverted neutral currents. Hang on. Thinking about a typo here. Can you go back one slide a minute? Have I? Hang on, sorry. Uh, and again. What's the matter, Paul? It's the same slide, same text. Is it the same text? Yeah. Are you joking? No. <sighs> okay, so... Well, well, let's get everyone's s- opinion on this anyway. Let's get everyone's opinion on it anyway, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mm. I've screwed that one up. <laughs> That's yeah. the joys of live. Oh, dear you me. know me. <laughs> if I can drive a bus through it, I will. Yeah, well, I know. While, while the people are voting, let me read out uh, 201 for you. Okay. Effective means suitably placed for ready operation shall be provided so that all voltage may be cut off from every installation, from every circuit thereof, and from all equipment as may be necessary to prevent or remove danger. Yeah, I apologise. That's my absolute screw up there. Yeah. Apologies, so, everyone. Um, I shall flog myself afterwards. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll all flog you later. Don't you worry, I know you will. Right, I'm going to end the poll because everybody's voted, and I think... Right, and I'll share the results. And luckily, even though I screwed up on the text, got the reg number right, just got the text wrong. Reg number's 12, yeah. Um, No one voted for eight because eight's not in the options. (laughs) Number 12. Number 12. It is. These are definitely isolation ones. I'm dreading moving onwards now in case this is the same one. But yeah, regulation 12 means of cutting off the supply for isolation. This is, again, the disconnection and separation of every source of electrical energy. Now, this is one that's massively contentious with diverted neutral current at the moment, because we know that we have earth conductors and bonds that are now carrying neutral currents. They may be network neutral currents. They may be partly installation neutral currents. Um it's 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 a bit of a mess at the moment, and I've had some chats with some senior people at JPEL and stuff about this, and I really do hope that at some point there's going to be more guidance on this, because this is a known hazard, uh, and I don't mm. think the industry's got an answer for it, because the, the accountability sits with the DNOs. I see the outcome being something along the lines of external met blocks being mounted in insulated... That's already been done now, but a lot of the DNOs. The, yeah, the earth bars are now pro- insulated. Proactively for sparks as well doing fuse up world upgrades and stuff. Do you think that Sparks will stop using those metal blocks, the A4 or 8-way ones? I reckon, they won't be stopping I, I, selling them anytime They won't stop selling, but I reckon they're going to have to start mounting them on an insulating enclosure that are not exposed outside, and you know, unless you have the mains off or something. 
Uh, yeah, you can get a five-way Henley block, by the way, insulated one. That's what mm. the DNOs use, the grey ones. Something. Um, you could also use four as well, which um, obviously I considered safe system will work, but um, we'll, we'll move on because that was just one that I noted down, even though I got the text wrong, so I apologise. Um, let me just check to make sure this text is correct. Yes, fixed it is. Fixed electric motors. Go on, Dave. Yes. All right. 202 isolation switching every fixed electric motor shall be provided with an efficient means of switching off that's readily accessible, easily operated, and so placed as to prevent danger. Right. Yen 60204. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Talking about harmonized standard, Paul. Yeah, well. Okay. So what do we think here, guys? I think it's a I think the title gives us the clue, really. Snap. 12 again, isn't it? That's it, is, isn't it? Works in the title. Disconnection and separation of all sources of energy in such a way that disconnection and separation is secure. Please, if you can learn that part, it's a very important one when you're having debates about electrical safety. Yeah. It's one of those key parts. <clears throat> there's another there's another whole thing to know about working with motors and stuff and control panels about 60204 and other areas. And we haven't got no time for that today, but you do need to be aware that there's more to learn. If you have only a basic understanding that 7671 is your model to work from, you yep. need to just be aware. There's a lot more to learn in that area. Um, and just, you know, if you want to know more about that, then you can maybe send us a message and we can talk with our expert, Mr. Go at planning some chats about that as one of his special areas. Just, just on that as well, one of the things that's a big misconception as well, and a lot of things get missed in this debate of isolation, is electrical isolation and mechanical isolation. Mm -hmm. um, it's often, I've seen many major electrical contractors do lots of very good, well-planned out electrical isolations and completely miss the mechanical side of it. Yeah. So... Um, just keep that in the back of your mind. Right. I also put four for this. Yeah. System of work. Systems, systems of work. work. You know, a lot of stuff four will go to 12. 12 are twins. Yeah. Mm, very much. Um, so we'll move on. Now, John gets the best one of the lot. Go for it, John. Okay. So 132.16, additions and alterations to an installation. This is an important one. Well, they're all important, but uh, this is a good one. So no addition or alteration, temporary or permanent, shall be made to an existing installation unless it has been ascertained the rating and the condition of any existing equipment, including that of the distributor, will be adequate for the altered circumstances. Furthermore, the earthing and bonding arrangements, if necessary for the protective measure applied for the safety of the addition or alteration, shall be adequate. Uh, wait a minute if we launch the poll. Hang on, I will launch a poll on this one because just wait one moment. Because I want to change one. Okay, I'll close it my end and you can do what you need to do. So uh, I'm gonna uh, while you're doing that, Dave, I'm gonna go. This is the most breach regulation in 7671 by far. I've said it on loads of podcasts. This is the one where I have done lectures, Paul's been witness to it. I've done lectures for the IET, and I've said to people, if someone walks into your home and they don't check the earthing and bonding arrangements for the installation, throw them out the front door. This is the one that uh, I've seen so many electricians just breach, forget about it. Go and when you walk into any installation domestic, go and find the gas, go and find the water, go and check the bonding. When you're going into commercial activities, go and ascertain the, the point of, in, you know, the intake, the DNO head, the, the, is there an earthing conductor? Is it present? Is there bonding? Do we have records? If we don't have records, we should be going out and verifying it in some form or another and include all that in your pricing. Why? Because of 13216. You need to ensure that the protective measures are there and what you do doesn't make it any worse. And by the way, if anyone's wondering why the text is yellow, what I do as part of learning a regulation is, is I get a highlighter pen, which my missus has stole, uh, and I highlight key words. And then I read back the highlighted words, no additional alteration, temporary, permanent, shall made existing installation ascertaining rate in condition of any existing equipment including distributor will be adequate for the all circumstances earthing bonding necessary protective for safety addition alteration shall be adequate and it's just a way of compressing the importance of the keywords into my head so that i i learn that regulation but this is the most breached um i, I could do a whole mm. hour podcast on this one yeah. alone 
there should now be two poles available, mate. If there, if you see two, put the okay. Well, let's put the second one up. Pole. And this isn't just about earthing and bonding because if you look a bit further up there, rating and condition of any existing equipment. So if you're mm. going to get someone's house, for example, and put in an electric vehicle charging point, and it's only got a forty amp fuse on the incomer, well, forget it because not suitable. So you can't just go bunging an extra load in and hope all is well. And even things like putting, say, an electric shower in, you've got to check that the actual total load is still going to be suitable or it's going to be uh, appropriate equipment to actually cope with that. Otherwise, things are going to go wrong and you will get blamed. Yeah, and I think it's worthwhile mm. saying as well, I've spoke to a lot of sparks who've gone, well, what do I do? If, if, if I don't do the work, someone else will do it and they'll undercut me. Yeah. It is, it, this is the moral dynam- dilemma now. Mm. is do I make alterations that are worsement or a betterment? Yeah, Plus, if you can make an installation a betterment and it costs you an extra 25 quid or a couple of hours, but you know it keeps you out of prison, I would do it. I wouldn't argue semantics. I know it's very easy for me to sit here and say, but I've done, I've done years of domestic work and I have never made a penny for my employer and I've lost money and used lots of materials because I didn't want that installation to be more unsafe. And I can tell you now, I worked for a certain major gas organization in this country and they would quite happily put boilers on walls they would quite happily do all rations to the wiring and if it wasn't any earthing and bonding tough customer pays for it or not me personally and i'm not trying to virtue signal here but i would just put the bonding in regardless because i wasn't leaving the installation as a, a in a detriment i would i would do what i was taught right and that is ensure that the potential zone is established i had exactly the same problem when i was a qs for a london franchise of that mr electric kind of company that no longer really runs much and that any oh, yeah. work that we would raise you'd have to do a per item ticket including bonding and if they couldn't agree that we wouldn't do that and then i'd say right well this won't get i had to get right in the middle of the whole company's processes to say we can't move forward with anything if we can't verify this regulation we yeah, never see the safe, bonding do the main earthing uh Walk you away. know issue, you can't issue you, can, you can't pick up the ones to do you know, they had the system where they could pick up the prices, and the client would say, "Do this, don't do this." And uh, and another large company, uh, Home Serve, that they had a contract with, had the same kind of thing. This is like 10, 15 years ago now. They're all it's behaving very themselves now. It's very difficult, but it's weird that the danger notification forms have only been out for a few years. Well, more than a few years now, I suppose, really. But this is the sort of stuff that we should have been doing. To remember, twenty nine, take all steps to discharge your duty mm-hmm. of care. This is a this that most certainly could easily be a 29. We're not talking about 29 because that, that's your defense if it goes wrong. Henceforth, that's one of the most important ones to learn. But I will close the poll now. Um, and let's see what we've got. Uh, I'll share the results. So we have 30% regulation four, uh, 30% regulation five, 20% regulation eight, and regulation eleven. So we'll put you out of your misery. It's pretty now this one I'm I've pretty good showing, on. actually. I've cheated on this one. So I've gone with four and eight and five and eight because I couldn't make my mind up. I, I, I the, sat there going, which yeah. one? Which yeah, and one? The, the poll was split pretty much exactly the same way. Yeah, so um, it's, it's okay to have more than one. Um, but yeah, couple, four, five and eight, effectively. A couple of things thrown into the chat just to kind of add to this. Uh, Eddie has said, this is why I show on uh, R2 results on schedules of results. Instead of just ticking the presence and continuity of an R2, you can actually give a result value for an R2. Um, yeah. And Dave says, Dave, yes, always work from them, um, not to them. Dave says, would you check the adiabatic and see if, for example, a six mil may be possible in a TNSTT system or go for the earth size present? Well, I'll, uh, if it's a TT, then yeah, it's almost certainly going to be fine because mm. that's full, it. If it's, current. if it's a TNS, I would say just upgrade it anyway because as we've already seen in other things, TNS is a thing doesn't really exist anymore no and it nope. could easily be changed to tncs next week so if you get and one of it appears to be tns it's in a six millimeter mm. upgrade it anyway just include it in the pricing and certainly for domestic stuff if you actually go and when you actually go and check these things you'll find that a huge number of people say oh the previous people never did this and never did that and never did anything explain to them why you're checking it and the fact that it is a vital safety feature and it should have been checked for the last 50 years and all that and most people understand without uh, telling that the previous person went there were complete rubbish but uh, that's the kind of thing don't just say oh we've got to do this because just sort of fill them in on the basics of it at least so. you know it's time to think you know is 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 the tns system of knowledge should we be taking it up should 
it be coming out to no longer be mentioned in 7671 or should it become a special system like IT? I very much expect those discussions have started at yeah, some well, point. I've had that discussion with, with a certain chair of JPEL and uh, the, the response I got was they're in there because certain installations are TNS on private mm -hmm. estates, etc. But yeah. the general consumer, we know because we've put it on Instagram. I emailed UK Power Networks, one of their lead asset engineers, and he put in writing, yes, consider it all TNCS because the network has been TNCS. We, we showed a picture on Instagram the other month where a TNS PILK cable had been adapted using a, a CNE cable, which completely removes the whole TNS. That doesn't that, that doesn't actually require much change with regards to the certification. You, you could put on the on your certificate quite easily that the transformer is on your compound, on your site, and then that gives a little bit of you know understanding about the reliability of a TNS system. But if that transformer's off your site and then you've got all the other nonsense going on. You're going to probably have to default to TNCS at some point. But if it's yeah. an on-site transformer, there's every chance it's a PNB. Maybe, but if it was yeah. TNS. Was what well, I'm let saying. me throw something into you. I was looking at a supply head today and with my contractor, and my contractor went, oh, this is a TT. And I went, but there's a separate new, there's a separate earth <laughs> coming in with the supply. And he went, yeah. I went, well, that's an SNE cable. And he went, what's that? And I said, it's basically the modern TNS. So there are times where you can have a brand new supply brought into a building and it'd be SNE. So rather than neutral nerve combining the cable, it'll be separate throughout the length until it gets back to the sub or to wherever it's jointed to. So that technically would make it TNS. Mm -hmm. So it gets, it does, it's getting more and more confusing with all the different systems and approaches and stuff. And the guys had never heard of it. They never heard of SNE. I went, but have you heard of CNE? And he went, yeah. I said, well, SNE is just different. Basically it's a separate earth tie wrap to the cable brought in. Anyway, right, let's move on. Mr. Skirm? Okay, so... New section. Can you uh, clear the poll down, Paul? Because it's uh, blocking my... Um... Apologies, I'll put the poll down. There we go. Okay, selection of electrical equipment, 13311 general. So every item of equipment shall comply with the appropriate British or harmonised standard. In the absence of such a standard, reference shall be made to the appropriate international IEC standard or the appropriate standard of another country. I'm not saying this regulation was made for you, Paul. It was. I was thinking but, the same. <laughs> but if a regulation ever was deemed worthy of your competency, this is this is this is Paul's one three two one six here. So right. uh, yeah, so we're going to go with. We could say five. We could say the football stadium across the road is just agreed with you. By the way. As you said, <laughs> yeah, five. They all went, yay! So South End have scored, <laughs> right? You know, uh, I, I agree. I'm, this I'm is, hanging this on is five. The, this is one of the biggest challenges, though, because we, we as a we as a team have had many debates over products mm. as to whether or not they're actually compliant with the in, the intended health and safety requirements of the low voltage directive, the EMC directives. Um, I have asked many a manufacturer that's come to me with products, and I've gone, great, I'll use your product, but you will demonstrate compliance with all the relevant British and harmonized standards. Now we know there are products out on sale that don't are made not even to a British standard. Um, so, or a European standard as far as aware. So I don't even know how they're even allowed to be sold, but they are. Um, but again, it's for the designer of the installation. And this is the trouble. It's always down to the designer or specifier. Which is sad. I mean, you could put bits of four in there as well, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. But this is where departures from 7671 on a certificate really comes in. So I expect a designer to give me a separate document telling me what's, what regulations they've departed from. They never do. Mm. Obviously, on larger, one, yeah. on larger scale yeah. installations, you'd want some kind of document that kind of shows the decision tree in selecting equipment with regards to the manufacturers. And, or would you, would you expect the, the declarations and the literature and the instructions all to come in with your, with your commissioning paperwork? Well, that should be part of the um, the O M manual, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and the chances of the spark actually getting hold of the O M manual and seeing that before it it, um, it the, the building's know. finished. I mean, I suppose it depends on the, the the way the thing is structured. But if the if the if a designer's going to select it, 
the yes. installer would also need to know about how to erect it. But then Correct. the inspector has to actually do both of those things and has that data. So the information has to move through the chain. That's what I was just going to go down the, 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 the lines of a multi-signature insta certificate then. Mm. So, you know, if you've got a designer that is specifying equipment, then you should have an electrical, a multi-signature electrical installation certificate with the design part signed accompanying the design. Mm. Yes. And, and that's the information what I used to do. You require should accompany that or the information that the construction people require, the installer, um, I, I, I'm trying to use the term construction because it's what the term that's used in the in in the regs, isn't it? In the in mm -hmm. 761 in standard. Yeah. So the people who are doing the construction, the installation work, need that information. So they've either got to be given the time and resources to go and get that information themselves, or the designer should be passing those installation instructions on to the installer. The installer then should be passing the installation instructions on to the inspector and tester. But also, you know, there should be some passing of information from the designer for the design thoughts. I mean, I answered a query the other day from a gentleman that was trying to do an EICR on an IT system. I don't mean information technology. Or the earthing system or the non-earthing so system. IT. Yeah. And he didn't even understand what the, the way the thing had been designed. He had an, a, a, a residual current monitor on there. Mm -hmm. He was trying to get ADS in the traditional fashion. He's saying, but my, my earth will be finished is too high. Um, yeah. yeah you know, what, what, what is the fundamental design? What, what is the fundamental means of protection that's been designed into that installation? Mm. That information didn't get to him. So he couldn't, he, he just didn't know how to inspect the test because he didn't. No, and this comes back to the right records, Paul. This, this comes all back down to the records. I, I had on major projects where I wouldn't allow the install to happen until the designer signed off to say that his design was compliant yeah. and, and fit to be installed. Um, also, need to verify that the inspector is competent to test IT systems. Yeah. You know, functionality well, of insulation, you, you may have insulation monitoring, insulation port location systems, RCMs. Those require other methods of testing. I think the good thing about digital technology now is that most electricians have access to far more data than they ever had that mm, just comes yeah. in the box. Um, do you want to show you? John, you were going to say something. Yeah, so this one is the one where if you go, certainly for domestic things, if so you go somewhere and the customer's got some dodgy light fitting they bought on eBay or something, yeah. mm. do not install it. And this is why, because if it doesn't have any standards marked on it or C marking or whatever, then it cannot be installed. End of story. Um, and there's unfortunately quite a lot of this junk out there which they just buy and it's some imported piece of rubbish which doesn't comply with any standard so if you install that you're in breach of this and you could actually be uh, liable and prosecuted if it uh, turned out to kill somebody That's no electrical equipment should be put into use for its strength and capability is, maybe exist can i add a question at this point because okay. it's a question i have in my head all of a sudden when certain entities in the industry advise their members or others to get the customer to sign to say that they will, you know, whether it be the omission of an SPD or the departure with regards to equipment that's not of a, da, 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 is, you know, clearly if we just say here, I'm, you know, I'm not going to take responsibility, sign this, da, da, da. What kind of level of information should we give to the owner of the property or the use, you know, the owner of the installation for them to actually be able to accept the risk? Are we in any way, you know, are we able to do that? Oh, I for domestic, I don't think that's a viable option at all because yep. they're not going to understand what they're signing. Right. So this gets asked though. This does. This is an answer that the industry has given. The trouble is, is this is the industry's way of discharging their duty under Regulation Twenty Nine. But what you're doing is discharging your duty to people who are not competent to understand it and never will, especially in a domestic home. In the workplace, then they should have access to competent safety advice or third parties that can advise them accordingly mm. because they're an insured business they're an employer uh, in a domestic home you haven't got a chance and this is why i don't agree with some of the advice i think it's morally a bit wrong to be perfectly frank to just walk in and go yeah you just sign that bit of paper i won't bother with afdds or spds or anything else yeah. especially when the electrician is going mm, yeah actually you should really have that but i don't want to lose the job so it's down to you governor um, the, the other thing you've got to consider is that you would be considered in law, you know, a knowledgeable supplier, a competent person. So, so 
you know, you're discharging mm-hmm. your duty by saying, well, actually, you know, I'm going to avoid my duty of care. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say, just get this, sign this piece of paper to somebody who, you know, it's almost like a forced confession for want of a better way of putting it. You know, you see these terms on, mm. on these cop shows in America and stuff, don't you? Or, you know, confession under duress and, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, got, well, guys, we're going to speed this up now. I'm yeah. mindful of time. Um, who's next? Me. Oh, okay. Uh, 13312, general um, selection of electrical equipment. Where there are no applicable standards, the item of equipment concerned shall be selected by special agreement between the person specifying the installation and the installer, what we were just saying. Now, here's a curveball for everybody. Um, this, I'm not going to do a poll, but if everybody can remember the curveball from the last one, um, I'm just going to throw it up there. Regulation 30, exemption certificates. How many people look at exemption certificates? There's no applicable standards. This widget, this thing in me big, will do all this wonderful, magical, electricity safety stuff but it's not designed or built to any British or BSEN European standards or CE marked. All the CE marking is, you know, means something else. Um, who takes responsibility? Person specifying? The installer? How do you discharge your duty of care to ensure that that equipment will function that meets the essential health and safety requirements for EMC for the low voltage directive that protects persons and property in the normal use of an installation? So where there are no applicable standards, I went to, I went to 30, which is the um, exemption certificates, which you obviously then need to go to the HSE and get written certification to exempt yourself from the electricity at work regs. Good luck with that one. We discussed that in part one. Um, and I think we, I've got we, the exemption. You should never be in that situation, really, to be honest, because no, anything you that's be. put on the market should has to be compliant. Otherwise, but, it's illegal but to be Paul, put on the this market. does happen. We know this is happening now in the industry. Hmm. We know there are products out there that shouldn't be out there. You know, the electrical safety first guys are snowed under with some of the products. We were talking about one the other day, um, which shouldn't be on the damn market. Um, but it is because the industry isn't regulated and the, um, oh, what do you call them? Uh, training standards. Training standards. They don't, they cannot police this. You know, I've, I've met the head of training <clears throat> standards and they police 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of stuff. And that's normally stuff that kills people, mm. you know, or injures a small child or gets into newspapers. They're swamped. So, yeah, exemption certificates subject to paragraph two, HSE may by certificate in writing exempt person, premises, equipment, systems, process and activity. Very rare. We discussed this in the last one. We're not going to go for it again, but just be wary of what you're getting. There's no shame in asking for evidence of compliance. At least you've taken a reasonable step under 29. If the manufacturer chooses not to give it to you, consider all the other variables, the essential health and safety requirements of law. And if you think you can make a case, go ahead. If you can't, then go and kick the manufacturer mm. politely. If you, sometimes on social media, I'll comment for people who are asking things like mix and match breakers, ask the manufacturer, ask the manufacturer, ask the manufacturer. That's for the big reputable companies, the ones we know. But when you've got something that's not got a standard against it, don't ring them up, email them, email them. get the response in an email, put that in your records as your defense, as part of your Reg 29 defense. Sorry, I'll shut up now. Okay, right, moving on. Um, who is it? It's Dave, go on. All right, so 133.1.3 general. Where equipment to be used is not in accordance with regulation 13311 or is used outside the scope of its standard. The designer or other person responsible for specifying the installation shall confirm that the equipment provides at least the same degree of safety as that afforded by compliance with the regulations. Such use shall be recorded in the appropriate electrical certification specified in part six. How do we do that? How do we well, verify it's no less safe? They don't. And then this is so I, I did a job years ago on the underground where there was dozens of departures in the design from the stand, from the regulations. Some of the equipment wasn't CE marked. Um, and, and this is how I learned 30, by the way, because I went to the chief engineer for the design house, one of the largest in the country, and said, look, where's your departures? They wrote a 15 page document, which was their departures. And then I took that and went to the HSE and said, can we have an exemption for that? And they went, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Very simple. No. No. Um, oh, okay. Well done. So now you're going to have to actually do designs compliantly. Uh, it caused chaos and cost tens of millions of pounds, by the way. You can tell it's a railway project. Um, but, yeah. So it's, it'd be interesting if you, if you start looking. And this is about us expanding our understanding outside of the norm 12 to 15. 30 is quite an interesting one. 
Mm. Again, it's that HSE in writing. So if we note it on the certificate, are we fully complying with the intent of the electricity at work regs, regulation 30, by noting it on the certificate? Is there a duty to cooperate and coordinate or consult with the HSE on these matters? Maybe that's part of the missing link that we're not doing enough of. Mm. Uh, moving on. 1332, and that's JW. It is. Uh, this is 132 characteristics. Every item of electrical equipment selected shall have suitable characteristics appropriate to the values and conditions on which the design of the electrical installation is based. That's section 132. And shall, in particular, fulfill the requirements of regulations 13321 to 13324. I notice a lot of shalls in there. So, again, this is not optional. It's something you will be doing. So this is a nice and easy one. Um, yeah. I'm not going to do a poll because I'm mindful of time, um, but I'm just going to put up what I what I thought it was. <laughs> yep. I think it's, it's fairly uh, evident. Yeah. That popular number once it's again. Very, very popular number. Um, so strength and capability of electrical equipment. And uh, as we've seen, that's the same as before. So Indeed you do. Right. We move on. I think I've chucked all of these into one slide, Mr. Skirm, because they're very all similar. Um, do you want to read through that? Take yourself off mute. So, um, selection of equipment, these are the 1332.1, through to four. Voltage. Yes, it is. Electrical equipment shall be suitable with respect to the maximum steady state voltage, RMS value for AC, likely to be applied, as well as over voltages likely to occur. Hmm. For certain equipment, it may also be necessary to take account of the lowest voltage likely to occur. 132.2. Hmm. Current. Electrical equipment shall be selected with respect to the maximum steady current RMS value for AC, which it has to carry in normal service, and with respect to the current likely to be carried in abnormal conditions and the period, e.g. operating time of protective devices, if any, during which it may be expected to flow. Another typo. typo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was flow, it's okay. Yeah, um, Mr. W. Yeah, um, so frequency equipment shall be suitable for the frequencies likely to occur in the circuit. Shall, still shall. Mm -hmm. Power, electrical, electrical equipment, which is selected on the basis of its power characteristics, shall be suitable for the duty demanded of the equipment taking into account the load factor and the normal service conditions. Lots of shalls again, and basically all the fundamental electrical um, characteristics. Yeah. So we need to know, we need to know the worst case and, you know, like the lowest or highest case scenarios for the voltage, the frequency, the current and the power. So could we interpret over voltages as transients? Yeah. So impulse, impulse withstand tolerance set to In certain services. categories. And then so you've got the need for over voltage protection, maybe. And also equipment should be suitable for frequencies likely to occur in circuit. So type A, type F, type B, dare I say B plus. Look, the sooner we get rid of type AC and type A and type F RCDs and chuck them. Was it, was it room 101? Yeah, <laughs> well, no, it's it's actually in here. It's John Ward's big box of rubbish. Yeah, just throw it in there. It is okay in John Ward's big box of rubbish. Type AC in the box. Type A in the box. Type F in the box. Everything type B. Job done. Then once we got that far, we will start looking at B pluses. Then, <laughs> yeah, Paul's just given away half of our next webinar. By the way, so just <laughs> ignore everything he said. We're near half of the next webinar. No, no way near. But yes, I agree with you. I think I think B should actually. I think we really should be creeping towards B as the minimum yeah. default. Um, but that's just based on the research yeah. we're doing. Um, so right. with that one, it was a five. Mm, strength fairly capability. evident. Strength capability. Um, five is a popular number in electricity work regs. It's one that goes through. And again, your defence is available. So you can defend yourself if you've done all, taken all reasonable steps and you know, done your due diligence. And strength um, and capability covers, as we've seen there, not just the voltage, it covers everything. So you've got to consider all of the possible situations and whatever you're installing has to be appropriate for it. So. Triple in harmonics. Yes. Indeed. Where the neutral current is greater than in the other ones. Mm. Um, you know, are we, are we good still with reduced size CPCs in flat twin? Say that again, Paul, sorry. 
are we still good with reduced CSA CPCs in flat twin cable? I don't think they do in Ireland anymore. No, no they not. don't. Yeah. They have a big CPC in Ireland as well, isn't it? Yeah. I can feel an economic stimulus coming on somewhere. <laughs> I mean, UK cable cables. manufacturers. It's been put in the, in the chat now. Um, most new 60947 isolated state 400 volts. Yeah, we normally run above. Yeah, but it's a nominal voltage. There's a tolerance on that. We, you know. Yeah, yeah it's a nominal. It's what we had to declare to harmonise with yeah. Europe, and then we voted out, and we still have to bloody harmonise. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're still one. exchanging power with them. We're still exchanging spit with them, are we? You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Dave said he'll be skint over type B RCDs. Well, the customer will be you. Won't will you? I no. have just put a type B um, on one of my railway stations as a main switch, and they're not cheap. No. Um, there's a bigger no, but one way to make them cheap is to demand more of them. Yes, very true. Of scale, very true. Right, moving forward, a selection of electrical equipment. One three 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 conditions of the installation: electrical equipment shall be selected so as to have stand safely the stresses, the environmental conditions. See regulation one three two five and the characteristics of its location. An item of equipment which does not by design have the properties corresponding to its location may be used where adequate further protection is provided as part of the complete electrical installation. So what do we think on this one? EAWR, it's a very common number. Please note in Chapter 13, there's mm -hmm. at least three regulations that talk about, dare we say, Appendix 5, external influences, my favourite ignored appendix. Mm. It's a fountain of information in there. Well, it's not finished. They haven't finished filling yet. <laughs> let's let's stop the digs now. Let's just accept it's incomplete. Um, it's number six. Number six. Very simply, um, adverse or hazardous environments. Mm. Um, basically, one of the things that I've seen a lot of on where I work on on the railways is they're tidal, they're coastal. So you go and put galv up, it won't last four or five years. It rots, it corrodes, uh, and then you then have C twos everywhere because all your cables are hanging out. And it just becomes mm. messy. That's not good for the life of the installation, never mind the safety. Uh, regarding the comment we said about Twin and Earth and Ireland stuff, Eddie has said Ireland definitely, ha definitely has the same size CPC. Also, still, Arma has a separate core. So mm. I'm looking at my copy of IS 10101, and I want to just I want to start reading now, that again and getting rid of that podcast. Can I just say now, Eddie, thank you for putting us onto uh, IS 10101 because it is a really enjoyable read, mm. and there will be a webinar on. The 20 key changes between it um to english and thingy look at john look he's holding his up i've got mine oh mine's that's up there oh come on i've got a copy yeah so look how thick it is as well yours is on the shelf paul and you'll I'll get, get yours on exactly. saturday 764 pages yeah what's, what's so, that between friends it'll be interesting to see little things like this as to why yes. they've made these changes <laughs> yes so i'm currently going through highlighting it it's a uh, Painful but fun, if that can be a thing. We, we anyway, need to get hold of uh, uh, Standards Island and see if we can get the uh, the previous versions. Mm. Uh, uh, listen, it was traumatic yes. getting the copy I've got. Um, adverse or hazardous environments, electrical equipment which may reasonably foreseeably. This is part of due diligence. If you can foreseeably and reasonably see that this stuff's going to happen, then you know you need to protect against what? mechanical damage. The effects of weather, natural hazards becoming more of a thing. Temperature, pressure, wet, dirty, dusty, corrosive. This is all external influences, guys. This is bread and butter stuff. Um, there are some great manufacturers doing some really good dedicated CPD now. So the CPD available is much better than it was 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, Dave. Me? You... me? My turn? Yep. All right. 133.4. Prevention of harmful effects. All equipment shall be selected so it will not cause harmful effects on other equipment or impair the supply during normal service which includes a switching operation. Take note, examples of characteristics which are likely to have harmful effects are given in Chapter 33, which is what, compatibility, is it? It is, yeah. Yeah. Right. What did we think here? Should I do a poll on this one? Do a poll on this one. You can do. Yeah, why not? Got about 11 more eggs to go through, so. Right, everybody, there should be a poll up, hopefully. <clears throat> I can't vote in it, but there you go. The switching operations on this particularly is to do with uh, surge protection again. So if you're going to install some massive load, like an electric vehicle charging device, for example, when that switch is on and off at whatever huge current it's got, that could easily put transients back into the supply, which could then damage and destroy other equipment 
unless you've, of course, installed the required surge protection. This is one of the problems, John, is, is years ago when we were all trained, we weren't taught to care about anything outside of the fixed installation nope. other than the earthing characteristics. It's getting far more complex. We have to understand a bigger picture now. So it's changing. Strange. I think the networks are in a bit of a state and it's a bit yeah. of a bum fight as to who does what now. Right, I am going to end the poll in a second. So, yeah. Paul, you're still muted. Right you're talking, mate. No, I'm not. No, other Paul. It's talking, but. Oh, Mr. Skirm is muted. God yeah. bless him. I could try and do an impression of him. <laughs> no. I did unmute myself, but I must have hit the wrong key. Um, you know, when you move over to commercial industrial, you need to think about motor switching surges from, from lift supplies, possibly, and, and um, you know, machinery and stuff that you might need to consider. Um, mm. But again, I mean, you know, transients, we're, we're focused so much right now in 18th edition training on atmospheric origin now. We're, we're still not focusing on switching transients. No, no. I mean, Paul Brewton has just put in the thing, need to be careful with VSD cabling between VSD God, yes. and the motor. Well, that's not going to be under 7671 anyway. So, mm. you know, you're looking at a different standard there, really. I very I had, much doubt. I had on cooling the tube when we did the armoured connection into the, the fans, they were getting uh, hot at one end and freezing cold at the other, yeah. which was very strange because we were literally going, hang on a minute, it's red hot here. It's like a four meter runner cable and freezing cold the other end. It was, it was, yeah, there's some definitely funky harmonic stuff going on. So yeah, VSDs are a bit of a pain. I'm going to end the poll and I'm sharing it. And we've got 30% uh, regulation four. four and 60% regulation five and 10% of regulation six. So let's put everyone out of the misery. Four and five, without a doubt. Work activity, safe systems of work, and uh, strength and capability were, I think it just speaks volumes, just on the header, prevention of harmful effects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just reading the header is enough to try and guess what AWR it would be. But we'll move on. I will stop sharing. So well done, everyone who picked four and five and six. Yeah, I can see why you've done that, because adverse and hazardous environments would also be relevant this is the beauty of this there's no real wrong answers it's about your interpretation okay let's move on and who is next on that's, that's four that's five we know them one three three point five who's next what was it i'll Dave. go i just went, but i'll go again i'll go again oh no Why john not? do john john do john then. go on john okay so one three point five new materials and inventions where the use of a new material or invention leads to departures from the regulations, the resulting degree of safety of the installation shall not be less than that obtained by compliance with the regulations. So this is departures again. Such use shall be recorded on the appropriate electrical certification specified in part six. Yeah. What do you so think, this... boys, on this one? Well, you're talking this about one... departures again, so I'm thinking about your curveball. Okay, you yeah. know, but yeah. I'm also thinking about the fact that we can take, for example, electric vehicles where these devices are reinventing themselves and the regulations aren't keeping up. Even the code, even the code of practice isn't keeping up. Yep. Um, so we look at equipment there. We could talk about systems. We could also talk about uh, so four. We could also talk about five. Specific capability of the equipment, and then depending on what we're doing, we can even look at you know if we're looking at EV issues, we could look at eight. Depends on the issues you've got in front of you. Yeah, and that's the thing. I, I my initial thoughts were five and thirty, hmm. because that the whole um, recording on certificate was straight away. If you're recording departures or issues, it's yeah. again, have you considered number thirty and use of new materials, strength and capability? Hmm. See, I've I got. Going. I mean, if you're looking at certain like electric vehicle charging points, you now I allow seventy volts to occur on on an earth. I'm like, it's in a standard. It's in there, but I don't know if I'm be if I'd be happy to kind of accept that. No, I you mean know. another one you might want to think about is um, is eleven really because when you come to EV charge, you know disconnection, which is exactly what you just said, David. Yeah, the possibility of current, you know, being there. Well, we're talking about a standing voltage of seventy volts, but that's going to drive a current, harmful current through the person, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, it doesn't say uh, an excess of current in every part of the system. No, so that's an excess of current in the in the protective part of the system, isn't it? We are at a point now where, you know, every other month there's a new toy, a new intervention, a new thing leading us forward, going to a leading market that's being pushed and driven heavily. 
when we're waiting for you know for their standards or their product standards to actually catch up for then the code or that lower level what was that level is it the, the bottom level Paul? was it the level above of your triangle earlier where the code of practice would be um well, the the non iet documents were the just best practice stuff right and then the and next then above level that was the iet recognized right. and then we'd have the so next level where we get to our standard yes. standard you yeah. know and so we'll, we'll be watching it gradually get there whilst all the time we're installing things yeah uh, eddie's put a comment in the chat 3329 i'm assuming he's talking about regulation 33 revocations and modifications mm. um mm. Mm. It's an interesting curveball Eddie's thrown at us there. Yeah. Systems yeah. and equipment which were subject to provisions which have been revoked now subject to these regulations. I, I don't think it would, Eddie, uh, maybe worthwhile talking about that in the questions afterwards, um, if you can give us a little bit more info. If you give an example or something. Yeah, I'm sure he's probably thinking about control panels and all the good work that he does on the mystical yeah. panels he builds. He builds, they're excellent. So... Mm -hmm. Let's move on. We know what five is. No electrical equipment should be put into it. Yeah, I knew it was a curveball. Thank you, Eddie. I could just see it pop in the side of my eye there. <laughs> um, and then it, obviously the exemption certificate. So that's why we went for five and 30 as a, a start off a 10. Now, the next one, Paul Skirm and John's getting all the best ones here, aren't they? Yeah. So erection and initial verification of electrical installations. 134.1.1 erection. Good workmanship by one or more skilled or instructed persons and proper materials shall be used in the erection of the electrical installation. The installation of electrical equipment shall take into account manufacturer's instructions. Now, it's interesting that in the, in the building regulations, they also use the term proper materials. I was about to say, how would you answer the question to define proper materials? Well, the building regulations describe... Uh, proper materials in the in the um, in the approved documents, but proper that, materials would be materials. It's in the workmanship we, one. In the, yeah, in the, seven, in the workmanship one. Yeah, you, you know, your proper materials would be products which meet the relevant harmonized standards to prove that they are safe. Products <coughs> which meet. Um, I'm jumping ahead here, but you know they have the adequate strength and capability. You know. Mm. Um, so maybe five. <laughs> yeah. um, as one of them. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's so, another one that I think we could put to this as well. Hmm. Um, whatever. And what, um, I don't even know what Paul is, but obviously, because I haven't seen this. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to put up what it is and I'm going to go on my rant. 16. Um, this is your workmanship. To be competent to prevent danger and, and injury. Yeah. So good yeah. workmanship material. This is the second, in my opinion, most breached regulation in 76701 um, because the it used to be, I think it was 133101 originally in the 16th edition um, when it was the dashes. And it used to be good workmanship material should be used by competent persons in the erection of an electrical installation or words to that effect. Now it's changed to this because the word competency is a requirement of the law. So they've removed competency with the exception of inspection and testing. Now it's skilled and instructed. You only have to be competent to test, um, which is not great because this is why, and, and I'll be brutally honest, I've spoken to many, many electricians out there that have worked on major projects or medium-sized projects where there'll be one spark to 15 labourers, um, which can cause a bit of chaos and also can affect the, the, the use of proper materials and the skills to install the proper materials. Another mm. thing that comes into effect but the you installation just, of equipment, take into account yeah. manufacturing instructions. Some of the manufacturing instructions are wrong. Yeah. I mean, it, materials are only proper materials if they're erected competently. Yeah. You know? So having competent inspector at the end. You know, how many light fittings have we seen? They will use red isolation tape on the device, or on the MCB when you're installing the light. Well, that's a breach of regulation for. How many, say, in, wiring shall be to the IE, IE 16th edition, the IE regulations or... Uh, you're using NIC approved oh, we were, or whatever the hell we that is. We were looking at a product just the other day and the manufacturing guidance said to refer to um, BS7671-2018 and then they worded it, the code of practice for electric vehicles. So the manufacturers got things crossed over. Yeah, manufacturers yeah, do. That was, that and that was the um, charge point that we were charge, looking at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, the charge point the weekend. But even something as simple as that, for your technical department to get that crossed over, 
Mm. And, that, you know, and we see it all the time, IEE printed into, you know, into modern right. so standards. Just, just to be clear here, the minute you see the words IEE in a document, you can assume under 29, nobody's done any due diligence. Because that immediately is a red flag for me. If I see a document that says IEE, it means I'm the first person due diligently reading it. And that scares the living bejesus out of me since they haven't been the IEE for long what, time. 17, 18 years now. Mm. Yeah, it's just old stuff copied and pasted, basically. And yep. the thing with instructions, it is worth reading them because I put in sort of adoption hob the other day. Part of the installation instructions, once you'd wired it in and put it in the workshop, whatever, was to actually clean the glass top of it before it was actually used. And that was actually written in the instructions to the manufacturer. Now, that's why exactly, because it wasn't like dirty, but it did actually say clean the top before you switch it on. Wow. Yeah, so, I, can, I, can, I can follow that one because there may be, there may be that there's a manufacturing or, 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 a, or a transit coating on that that, 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 that could fume off and, and, and yeah. end up being poisonous. Yeah, mm, so, good point. I mean, so, I, I, I think we could throw into this one, I think we could throw five in as well, Paul, because we're talking yeah. about materials in this reg as well. Yes, I agree. Five. I went for 16 because this is yeah. my biggest bugbear. But yes, absolutely. Five, six. This is a number of yeah. them. Eight. This this is one that links to all of them, to be perfectly frank. Yeah. But this is the starting yeah. Um, yeah. line for it. OK. Um, yeah, just uh, this annoys me. This this uh, I, I had yesterday a message from someone who was wiring up a cooker. And he said, I'm going to use HO7 Flex to wire up the cooker. And I was like, great, fantastic. But no, the manufacturer instruction says use twin and earth. And it's like, but HO7 is far more suitable. So I'm in breach of the manufacturer's instructions by using HO7. And I was like, no, you're not. You're working from the intent of the regs. If you know you're selecting and erecting better, more suitable for the environmental conditions and safer, then sod your BS6004 twin and earth. Think about, how lazy you, writing. think about how you would write a technical report. I wrote, I installed Twin Earth because, I installed HO7 because. Think about the technical support you can get for one decision over the other. Yeah. yeah? And you can develop a great strong argument for HO7. Twin Earth, other than it was written by this person, what else have you got? You know? Yeah. So just think about what you can evidence yourself with. All right, well, let's keep talking about erections. Yeah. Um, Erection and initial verification of electrical installations. Uh, it's my turn now, isn't it? Right. So the characteristics of the electrical equipment as determined in accordance with section 133, which is the last bit, shall not be impaired by the process of erection, i.e. don't damage all the equipment by drilling loads of unnecessary holes in it and leaving them exposed or compromising the integrity of the unit. Um, certain things like EMC love big holes in, equi in equipment, radiated emissions, etc. All that invisible electricery we don't see. Mm. Um, what do we think here? I think this is a cut and uh, cut and paste, cut and shut one. Yeah. <clears throat> Number five. Yep. Do not impair the equipment, the erection of your equipment. Very simple. Or one. You what? Sorry. Or one. All systems shall at all times be of such construction as prevents, so far as reasonably practicable danger. Or yes. one. Yeah. And can so I just dragging cables in through conduit or singles in through conduit and you shave off the insulation off? You haven't met that, have you? Can I, burn on the end of the conduit. can I just say that Eddie in the comments has filled me with joy because he's just put 16th edition amendment to 1330101, which means I still remember all the regulations from the 16th edition. Get in. <laughs> they were much better numbering. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I know I'm old school. Um, yeah, so there you go. We went with five on that strength of capability. Um, yep. It was a given. And now we're going to go with, oh, there you go. Next one. I've screwed up again, but never mind. Dave. Economy, okay, so carrying on with the last one here uh, of the erection. Conductors shall be identified in accordance with section 514. For identification of terminals is necessary, they shall be identified in accordance with 514. And of course, it's already popped up, so I'm not going to do a poll because I accidentally pushed the damn button, so apologies. Um, yeah. Why have you put 10? You've put 10 because of connections? connections. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I immediately yeah. saw terminals. I immediately think connections. I use as little of that information as possible to just twin or pair up regulations if I can, and then work from that. Just helps develop my understanding. You could go with four as well. Any of the four, you know. 
I'm going to say, yeah, you got you can have um, a suitable construction. Poor termination is going to be a poor construction, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, mm. it's, it's know, not the end of the road. Yeah. It's the start of the road. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Identification of terminals. Um, when necessary to prevent danger, every joint connection. Can it be electrical suitable for use? That's why I used it. That was my starter on my also, Tuesday adventure. Also, Regulation 9 talks about integrity because it talks about the potential for introducing high impedances in your electrical continuity. Yeah. So, in fact, weirdly enough, I did actually on my book, I did mark nine down on the on the other side of the column because I was having a huge debate as to which one I would pick first. Mm. Well, mm. I just went with 10. But nine, yes, absolutely. Right, John. Hey, so continuing on, this is 134.14. Every electrical joint and connection shall be of proper construction as regards conductance, insulation, mechanical strength and protection. <laughs> So you know what one I went for here? And again? Snap. Yeah. But yeah, I think we can go for the same that we've all come up with just now for the previous. Um, right, we will move on. Mr. Skirm. Okay. So 1315 erection. Electrical equipment shall be installed in such a manner that the design temperatures are not exceeded. We'll run a poll. This is a good one for this a is, poll. This is one that I actually have to spend a few minutes talking about when I do regulations courses because... Quite often, the design, I mean, a designer may have some assumed design temperatures, and we wouldn't come with specifics. A designer would, would shouldn't say, oh, it'll run exactly that temperature, but a, a range. But the installer may have a, an alternative method of installation that the designer didn't quite identify, or there could be another characteristic. And it's very easy for the initial planning of a design to not end up being installed for the actual temperatures of the system to then be different you know, many different external influences. So understanding the design temperatures at the beginning, middle and end phases is actually quite important, but it's often, it's not really something we look for when we inspect from my experience, especially with 2391, it's not something we really talk about, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if your designer has designed a, an installation to, or a circuit to go on tray work or trunk in, which is going to be sort of, I don't know, at low level in the factory or at, or, or at mid height or two meters off the floor. And you've got a, a you know, a 10 meter, 15 meter apex factory with a glass roof. And the customer decides, well, I don't really want it there. When it comes to installation, he pays the installer to get some scaffolding in and, and run Very it through higher. the purlins. So you've got all this uh, solar gain uh, on, on the trunk in and or the, or the SWA on the tray has got all this solar gain coming into the, mm. to the clear roof. Solar gain is a perfect example because many times the designer won't be told all the information about the windows, about the doors. We had, um, I don't know if it was at a railway or somewhere else where I was doing thermal imaging um, training. And one of the guys said that he had a board, which half of the board was just regularly tripping because the board was just constantly under solar gain. So the overloaded devices were quite warm already. Um, and that's a, it's a good point because, you know, so there's a designer sitting at his desk in an office may not have the information about that's right those street the feeder pillar cabinets can get red hot can't they they can during do, yeah. summer of, and often on the thermal image of... often on thermal image the cables are the coldest thing in the picture mm. you know <laughs> so well i'm going to end the poll um one example actually i'm going to give on that one because i agree um i i worked on a railway depot where up in the up in the high span of the roof during the summer the temperatures were getting over 50 degrees and the luminaires were not designed. None of the cabling was designed to work in that sort of ambient. They were all designed at 25 and 30 degrees C. So people wondering why their circuits were failing, things were tripping, cables were starting to show evidence of melting. Yeah. Um, and it was during the winter shutdowns they were finding all this. But it was only when somebody actually used uh, a temperature probe and actually pointed up to the scene, they went, that's like 56 degrees today. It's boiling down here, but how's that lighting containment going to feel? So they managed to get up during the middle of the summer in the peak took an isolation possession and they found it was absolute trunking was red hot to touch and the cabling was far too undersized um so yeah and that can prematurely fail the life of assets i've seen many an led manufacturer come in and go this is the performance of our luminaire great will it work at 55 degrees for four months of the year no right well then it's going to fail you're not going to get the life one sentence now that one of the one of the uh, attendees of the participants is going to end up with the, i'm going to say led fit-ins in a, a cooker extraction hob in a commercial kitchen 
over a mm. big gas range. Mm. There's oh, one particular high high end steakhouse in the area near me that is running without any lights in the top of their range now because we can't get anything to go in there. Nobody will give us a, a fit in that will run at the temperatures that we're expecting to see in that canopy. Right. Well, I'm sharing the results and 50% have gone regulation six, adverse or hazardous. 30% have gone safe and gone regulation five. And then 20% have been very risque and gone regulation 11. Um, I'm going to share what the, the initial thought was, six. Um, that design temperature and the word exceeded to me was um, adverse or hazardous environments, which is why I went with it, but five, absolutely. Um, regulation 11, yeah, okay. Design temperature not exceeded. It could impact... Um, Means protecting from excess oh. of current potentially. Yes, we just set an example I've seen is where overload devices operate prematurely because huh. they're solar loaded. So that's yeah. definitely a valid answer there. Yeah, yeah, yeah because you know, they're they they're, 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 they have a design life. They have a limited design life. Those things as well. You know, mm. you could yeah. chuck four in there again. Four is a pretty universal one. Right, we're going to move on. That's, that's one of the reasons why they have this other book, don't they? For, for <laughs> you, you know. Indeed. Right. Moving on. Uh, it's who's next? It was me last, I think. John. So John. Yep. John. It is so 134.106. Uh, electrical equipment likely to cause high temperatures or electric arcs shall be placed or guarded as to minimize the risk of ignition of flammable materials. Again, that's shall. Where the temperature of an exposed part of electrical equipment is likely to cause injury to persons or livestock, that part shall be so located or guarded as to prevent accidental contact therewith. Great words they use here. Well, John, mm. that's pretty much in the first edition, isn't it? Yeah, it basically is. So. Variation of the one from 1882. So that regulation has been in there in mm. some worded form for quite a while. So what does everyone think there, boys? What do you think? Throw a number out. 4-1. Yeah, 4-1. The, obviously, the um, construction can be degraded. 6 as well, I work with six. You're with six. I agree, four one. Yeah. Four one's a fantastic go to rig. It is a go to rig. It is four one's a cracking one. To be honest with you, mm. um, but yeah, I went with six. To be honest with you, I went. I went with adverse and hazardous environments, uh, just because of the high temperatures, etc. Uh, effects of weather, natural hazards, temperature. Seven. seven would work. Seven would work. All customers. Uh... Uh, all conductors in a system which may give rise to danger shall either or uh, have such precautions taken in respect of them, including where appropriate they're being suitably placed, as will prevent so far as practical danger. You know? Yeah, no, okay. fair enough. Definitely. Okay, we're on the home straight now. Um, we're going to go with 13417, and it's back to you, Paul. Okay. So 137 erection, when necessary for safety purposes, suitable warning signs and or notices shall be provided. What do we think, guys? Well, this this is more system for me, or you know, warning and things. That's four for me. Yeah, it sort of fits in with the uh, whole documentation and information yeah, that information. should exist. So I'm gonna go on a rant here because on. I agree with you. And this is the regulation I use to justify what some people call death by signage. Um, but I have I have been of the view on a lot of installations I've worked on when the spark has properly labeled it up and given as much information as he can, then the next boat's going to thank him because the odds are most of the records and the O&Ms are going to get lost in someone's office or like on the railways. You'll hand information over to a, a train operator. Seven years later, it's a different company. All that information has gone. This is why I'm trying to design switch gear with records that can go inside, uh, get labelling schedules, mm. so as much information is available for the person there. Do, and that's I mean, what I use. Is there a sign on the inspection report that actually talks about the suitability of the signage warning signs with regards to the life and the environment that they're used in? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. is. That? That labelling should be sufficiently durable. I don't know. I don't think... There, yeah, durability I is, I mean, to me, is... Fundamentally, we know they're taking some stuff out anyway, so I don't think they're going to add anything, but, you know. But this is to me about, you know, activities, operation, maintenance, to give the guys a chance, high protective conductor currents, warning of operational switching, dual supplies, all that good stuff. 
you know the what I would call the eight labels to a views board your 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 designation well, I mean, your voltage your period of inspection your RCD your fed from dual sources your high protective conductor yeah. currents your sensitive to electronic uh, test equipment your oh, the little uh, AFDD ones or period of inspection well, heck, whatever. If you've got- if you've got a multi-story building or you've got looping feeders, and you may even think about a DNC label warning. You never know. Mm, diverted neutral current, yes. I've run out of space on my board for a diverted neutral <laughs> current one. Might have a few inches left on the backboard, but... Right. Uh, where are we now? Back to me. Okay, so we're on the home stretch now. We're on the, one of the, the last parts of Chapter 13, erection initial verification. So getting into inspection and testing now. Uh, initial verification. During erection and on completion of an installation or an additional alteration to an installation and before it's put into service, appropriate inspection and testing shall be carried out by skilled persons, competent, first use of competent, to verify that requirements of this standard have been met. Appropriate certification shall be issued in accordance with Chapter 64. First use of the word competent. And yeah. oh bloody hell, I've pushed the button accident. So. Yeah, but it's a, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, it's an obvious competency one, isn't it? The word yeah. competent competence. Um I kind of I'm not a massive fan of this section of the regs, to be honest with you, this because it used to be just inspection and testing. And then they divided it up into initial verification and periodic, and I just thought it was stupid because inspection is inspection and testing is testing. Yeah, I think I think the problem was they've obviously really split down the initial verification from the periodic. There are some situations where periodic may not be considered necessary due to other devices like installation monitoring devices or having a strict plan maintenance, but we can never apply that idea to initial verification. And we can apply limitations and excuses and nonsense to EICRs to suit the expectations of a client. Whilst it's, it's, it's clear with initial verifications, we must do them. They are I not- just think inspection you know, and testing was inspection and testing. It, on maybe it's a different school. process. Yeah, it's a different process. I, I'm sitting here thinking a um, number of times I've seen limitations on an EIC and when there's been investigations, how many times a contractor has said um, when the when the expert witness has gone in and, oh, but it's only a C3 on a, on a, on a brand new installation or oh, I wouldn't really be a C2, it, you know, but this is a brand new installation that's just been put into service. I shouldn't be able to code it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the, the, wording, the wording in four here is just maintained effectively to prevent danger yeah so neutral verification is a must but ongoing maintenance is effective to prevent danger which look allows many, you to play with look, it look how many new builds dave people are finding horrors in new builds but they must have initial verifications done well maybe you, uh, well yeah I'm not the immature, the immature, comment here yeah, the, the immature situation was a incompetent initial verification yes yeah i'll, I'll, I'll agree with that uh, for anyone who's watching, just Google Emma Shaw case, and that's a tragedy that was avoidable, sadly. Um, right, we will move on. But yes, 16, no person should be engaged in any work activity where technical knowledge or experience is necessary to prevent danger or, where appropriate, injury, unless he possesses such knowledge or experience or is under such degree of supervision as may be appropriate having regard to the nature of the work. I wish they'd word this a little bit better. I get what they're meaning, but... It's very flaky. I mean, the problem with instruction yeah. is... I mean, remember, instruction is instructed electrically, and that must be, you know, some companies will go, oh, we'll have a QS as the competent person who's verified by who's CPS. Who's never on site. Who's never on site, but he's effectively instructing them by signing off the paperwork. It's very, very badly interpreted in this and, and this is what annoys me. When somebody says, oh, I've got a QS, oh, great. If he's not mm. on site, there's no QS. No. And it's, I, not, I, it's pointless. The whole registration system is pointless. Yeah, they need and it's skilled, you know, um, competent instruction or, or skilled instruction it has to be on site. Dave, next one. Yep, okay. Um, carrying on with initial verification, the designer of the installation will make a recommendation for the interval to the first period inspection and test as detailed in Chapter 64. Note the requirements of Chapter 34, maintainability, should be taken into consideration. So this is the old the, the whole flannel from TN3 as well, wasn't it? This is the whole recommendation of the first interval and then everybody just uses the schedule to do the ongoing ones so you get three years and five year cycles but not proportional yeah. to the risk i don't know do you think that has life in gn3 because they've taken out of the eye of the in-service inspection testing of electrical equipment they've taken the frequency interval out of that i hope they get rid of it 
it's got to be risk based. It's got to be the eyes of the inspector is the, has to be the most competent person, the guy in the board, in the trunking, in the in the trenches. If he says this is crap, um, I'd get this reinspected every two years. Then that's what it is. Mm. Uh, the trouble is, a lot of major contractors, major employers, they have fixed financed regimes of three years, five years, which is which is well, yeah, shit, of course. to be perfectly frank. But it's just financial planning, isn't it? It is. So, what does everyone think on this one then? Four. I like four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked four on this one as well, actually. Funny enough. Um, yeah, yeah. Four systems, work activities, protective equipment. All systems should be at all time constructed to prevent, as far as reasonably practical, danger at all times, all times, including when being initially verified and installed and tested and all that good jazz. Right, Mr. JW, sir. Okay, so uh, 105.1, it is recommended that every electrical installation is subjected to periodic inspection and testing in accordance with Chapter 65. So uh, this sort of follows on from the previous one. Um, we're obviously going to set a period for it to be uh, inspected and tested. Can we run the poll for this last one? Yeah, if you want. Hopefully everybody will relaunch. There we go. What do we think, guys? Some common numbers, hopefully, over these near four hours of this that we've done. If you're watching this on YouTube, apologies, you can't see the poll again. But oh, but everyone on YouTube, everyone watching. whilst people are voting, do download HSR 25 and have some fun with it. Because the more of you reading this, the better. The more you learn, the more you earn. And once you've read four, tw 10, 20, 30 times, you then download HSG 85, which will then help you understanding how to create safe working practices. Yep. Okay, people are doing well. They're picking good numbers here. Give it another second and we'll close it. So please vote. It's the last one. So the other thing is, is knowing these is, 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 is knowing how exposed you are to liability and, and, and what your chances of, uh, I mean, knowing these is you get out of jail card, isn't it? It is complying with it these. Is. Oh yeah. I, documenting it is is your reg 29 when i when i work when i work with you know f food producers or i've worked with car manufacturers i've worked with many large large companies you know international companies i work for their emea divisions i'm looking at the guidance to the you know these legislations or i've got books on the directives and i'll get the raw documents as well and i'll have to interpret them first before i then go to the more detailed technical guidance to reinforce you know, and you've got to kind of go that way so you know the end debate. Um, and as you said earlier, Paul, it's all free to download, the the, uh, the, the top tier stuff. So I'm sharing the results. Regulation 4, we've four. got 60%. Um, regulation 6, 10%. Regulation 11, 10%. Regulation 12, 10%. So 12 mm. means of cutting off supply for isolation. Uh, yes, that would be part of it, definitely, because you'd need to isolate to, to work safely. Although, let's not get into the debate about working life. It, it is part and parcel of the job. It just needs to be done very safely and appropriately. Um, means cutting yeah. off There's, that's, the, current. There is a whole other discussion, which we'll do on another podcast, like about the industry bringing in this fear issue of working life. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, it's great for making I can't work live, so I'm not going to do the job properly. Mm. Excuses for contractors that then don't give you a discount for but it. It's a, yeah, but then the, the outcome is you don't get effective maintenance. You know, yeah, I know. Well, bits. I'd love to meet the person who came up with this. You can calculate your ZSs. I'd love to have a word with them in a dark room. Um, anyway, but we'll cover that in a podcast as well at some point. More fun to come. More fun to come. Um, right. So I'm going to stop <coughs> sharing and I will tell you what our one was. Well done to 60% of you because you went with four as well. I went yeah. with four as well. Yeah, systems. Yeah, system work activity. Yeah. It is, it is inspection and testing by definition is all about safety. I am mm -hmm. inspecting. How do I do it safely? I am testing. How do I do it safely? How do I verify the installation is, is energized and life and safety work on or near these energized conductors? Um, what recommendations can I do make to yeah. make the installation safer? Uh, Obviously, you can use the rest of the regulations for any observations that you make. Yeah. But the act of doing the EICR is an act of trying to maintain a system effectively to prevent danger, which comes more immediately for me under four. But that, that reg in itself requires compliance with 16 persons to be competent. Yeah. Yep. Or the, the clause in 7671. This is this is why we're talking about regs and regs here. And 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 whereas I I, I hate the fact that the regs in 7671 are called regs. They should be clauses to me. 
Because this is something that I'm starting to really I'm starting to really start thinking about this, calling them clauses and going to but I'm used to I'm used to calling them parts and not sections. And then the sections instead of you know all this stuff. Nice. But when I go to other standards and I see how they use the wording, it's just it seems like seven six seven has its own unique terminology. It's no, it's an it's a you niche, know? it's a niche to put put it on a a plateau in parallel of EWR. The whole term requirements for electrical installations and calling it IET wiring regulations. So you've got the word requirement and regulations. They should just be called rules. Like they used to be. John John will agree with me here. They were called rules for a reason. That's what they should go back to. They call themselves rules yeah. in the beginning somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you watch our our, our 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 webinar on the first edition, Dave, which I highly recommend you check out on YouTube, <laughs> they were called rules. Rules for electrical installations. Yeah. If if you look at BS four one six three, which is a code of practice for for classrooms and stuff, or seven four three old code of practice for earthing. You know, should they should they really be called the code of practice for the co not the approved code of practice, the code of practice for electrical installations? You yes, know? it should be, and that's how it should be considered. It's a code of practice. Um, right, moving on. That's it. Oh, okay. Well, it's a game over sign there. Really, um, we can move on to questions. We can move on to. I'll leave the defence clause up because that's always good. Um, or we can. Yeah, so does, it, does anyone want to read out the questions? Now, yeah. thank you very much for tolerating us, by the way. Apologies for my minor errors. I'm human. I'm tired. Yeah, it's been a long, long hours at work get longer, man. All right, I'll, I'll read a question. Um, yeah, please. Mr. Betteridge says, um, Hi, chaps, following on from last week's Skate In, I found another Skate L. Skills, knowledge, attitude, training, experience, and limitations. So that's not a question. That's actually some good information from like this. I'll start with like that. Yes, that. limitations. Mm. Mm. When to say no? It, it, it's a, it's a, it's an, you know, it's a, it's a synonym for saying when to say no, isn't it? Like well, let's that. let's remind us what was skate in. Uh, skills, skills, knowledge, knowledge attitude, attitude uh, training, training, experience, experience, interest, and no, the ability to say it. Interest and no, the ability. That's it. Because we expand expanded skate to skate in in the first one. Yeah. And Dave's found Skatel, which is training experience and then limitations. And then that, I love that one because that works That works really well with when I talk about companies about how to determine competence. Because, you know, to determine competence, you need to know what you don't know and, you know, know your limitations and such. Okay. Well, that's, that's, you and your intelligence, <laughs> Mr. Beveridge. Four stages of competence, isn't it? You know, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, unconscious competence. Yeah. So it's knowing those limitations. Yeah, I love that. By the way, and the only way we'll work those out is by testing them regularly and reassessing them, you know, via CPD tracking. Okay, uh, I'll read Dave's question that came up. I'm going to try to apply some EAWR. I have a situation where an office block has been split up, and access to the DB from one company is not possible. There is no key or access. One, they should have access. Two. They should move the DB to a location they can access. My reasons are in 7671, 132.9, and 132.10, most likely others in part six. Access for inspection and testing, maintenance, and safe isolation, thinking EAWR 4, 12, 14, 15, and 29. What do we think? So we've got accessibility here. 132.9, 132.10 is... Four, definitely, Div. Hmm? Um, you know, um, 12, it means cutting off supply. Yeah, I'd go with that, definitely. 14, yeah, I'd go with that one as well. Um, working space, well, um, yeah, because it doesn't matter how much space you've got it around it. If you can't isolate it, you haven't got enough space of you, you know what I mean? And that's... Yeah, that's where 1329 and 10 are from. It's uh, emergency control and disconnecting devices. So these, obviously that's the issue with that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, if yeah, yeah. I mean, you need accessibility and you must be able to work safely. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. which, which would be part of maintainability in part three, the need to maintain things. And if you have any issue with access, we shouldn't in any way compromise our safety by balancing, by gaining you know by bending over yeah. by twisting or contorting our bodies to try to find a way to get access you know better yeah. planning for for planning definitely 
Yeah, and if it's not actually accessible at all, as in you can't even get into the room, adequate means of access, well, it doesn't exist. <laughs> no. So you haven't got it. So I mean, yeah. it's an interesting one that we, we sometimes find distribution boards in um, like uh, supermarkets or um, DIY stores and these kind of places. They're mounted right high up in the in the beams at the way so that, you know so the public can't get at them. Great. Great. That's fantastic. Oh. If, do you, if you mind, can I just chip in an answer here as well? So, Dave, the first, I stopped on there is no key or access. So um, I'm going to I'm going to transpose this sideways. So not not only is there electricity at work regulations, there is the regulatory reform order for fire safety. Mm -hmm. Regulation 17 of the reform order is maintenance and the duty to cooperate and coordinate and allow sufficient maintenance to prevent fire hazards. If they can't do that, they are in breach of, weirdly enough, the defence uh, article of the reform order which reads weirdly enough well i'm going to put this back on the screen and i'm going to read out the fire one so th this one in eawr says in a proceeding for an offense consistent of contravention it shall be defense they took all reasonable steps in the fire reform order it says in any proceedings for an offense under this order except failure to comply with articles 8 or 12 it is a defense for a person charged to prove he took all reasonable precautions and exercised all due diligence to avoid the commission of that offence. It's virtually word for word. And isn't it 29 in there as well? No, it's 33 in oh. the articles. Yeah, so they don't call them regulation, they call them articles. Mm. But just remember something, these laws can help you massively. So um, where I am at work at the moment, I think it's fair to say, we don't just use the electricity work regs, we'll use the fire regs. It's a bigger picture. You've got to look at the bigger, a bigger picture. picture. Yeah. And accessibility to equipment, uh, ability to give um, in access to inspections from the HSE to the to the fire brigade, you will get an improvement notice if you can't ag gain access to rooms. Now, I'll tell you now, a lot of employers are using GDPR, this Data Protection Act um, update, to basically stop people going in rooms. That's a crock of crap. They just need to get some lockable cupboards and put their shit away and allow people in to do their maintenance and inspections. Okay, we could also go with the Management of Health and Safety Work Regulations 1999, Cooperation and Coordination. Oh, stop that, Eleven. <laughs> well done. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where two or more employers share a workplace, whether on a temporary or permanent basis, each employer shall cooperate so, with the other employer concerned so far as necessary to enable them to comply with the requirements of prohibitions imposed upon them by or under the relevant statutory provisions. By part two of the five precautions workplace regulations, well, that's RFSO now, and 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 then it goes on from there. I'm not going to read the whole thing out. No. So you know, Dave, there's, there's three different pieces of legislation there, Dave. Yeah, Dave. The point being is, is if you look into the regs for all the answers, you won't find them. You need to look outside. Work from this is why we say work from the regulations up into the law. Get the line of sight into the law, and if it isn't in one, it will be in management of health and safety. It will be in the fire reform order. It will be in electricity at work regs. It may even be in the health and safety at work act. But they're literally four pieces of legislation that highly recommend you get familiar with because they are tools in your arsenal to to argue your case and argue your case very professionally and very well. Oh, right, number four. I'll get. Uh... Yeah. Right. Should we have this uh, deviation from Eddie? Yes, go on then, go for it. Yeah. Right. If we're able, right, if we're going to use deviations, the minimum should be the standard we are day to day working from, such as 7671. Then, should we need to go higher to make sure our ass is covered in a court of law? So, if I check that my deviation is a match for 7671, is that adequate? Or should I also ensure that my match is in conformance with the chain upward i would use i would look to use the term that mr skirm taught me and that is am i meeting the essential legal duty uh health and safety requirements of the directives and the laws above and around me um if i'm introducing a new product that isn't in 7671 because it's brand new what due diligence am i taking to take all reasonable steps am i documenting this sort of stuff are we getting you know um due diligence studies documented and defined and peer-reviewed within the business as to acceptability, tolerance, risk, all this good stuff. I, I genuinely get scared when people talk about just 7671 because people are struggling to understand potentially. But this is why I say work from the intent of it. The 7671 is the minimum. And all throughout that document, it talks and advises consistently um, that you need to still make your own decisions. I mean, where is it? Um, page two. 
where the publisher and contributors believe that the information and guidance given in this work, in the blue book, is correct. All parties, including you, Eddie, must rely on their own skill and judgment when making use of it. This is the due diligence, all reasonable steps. The publisher and contributors do not assume liability for anyone, to anyone, for any loss or damage caused by an error or mission in the work. So if they've made a mistake in the regs, which we know there are mistakes, it's not their problem. If something goes wrong, it's not their problem. You still have to do your due diligence. You still have to meet the intent of Regulation 29. Um, it's quite scary, actually, that one line, to be honest with you. But, yeah, I thought I'd... But it makes sense. I mean, you know, the IET have put the book together, or obviously who um, pushed the book out. It's the same thing as you know, if you contact them via phone or email, they can only give you a certain amount of information. They can't give you a definitive response. You know, well, in the same way, we can't really. I mean, you know, if 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 somebody came in and said, "Oh, look, I've got this installation here, or this, that, and the other," um, you know, there's there's mm. there's we, we we can only we only know about the installation what they're telling us via that message, yeah. and they, you know, we can't see the whole picture. From from your perspective, Eddie, you need to be able to go to sleep at night and say, mm. "Have I emailed enough? Have I asked the right questions? Have I done enough?" Now there'll come a line in the sand where you're going to go look. All I can do is advise here. So if you're building control panel, for instance, and you're building it from scratch, all your components are deemed DMC compliant, then your client says, oh, no, I want all this new widget and PLC or whatever, and there's no CE marking, no British standard for it, and it does a whole load of new gizmos that nobody's ever heard of, then you need to do some due diligence and advise your client, look, this is a departure from the norm. This is a new bit of kit. What, what due diligence is done? How will it affect the overall compliance of the system? Is there any yeah. EMC issues? Because the last thing you want to do, Eddie, is put, put something in and then find that it ends up tripping out something local to it or causing issues um, with it. Yeah. And then in, um, in the part one of this, we talked about due diligence uh, about 10 minutes in. Um, and we asked Mr. Skirm what he, you know, his, his, his uh, explanation of what due diligence would be like in the case of a situation going to court and prosecution from the perspective of someone, you know, embarrassed of prosecuting you or your defence, uh, you go back and watch that. And it's just a case of apply the best you can. If you stick within the boundaries of a, one, the 17671 book, it probably won't take long for your work to be, like, disproven so we'll, if you stick we'll, within it. We'll go to Eddie's last question and we'll go on to Afshin. Um, a bit of an odd question. When working logically in a court of law, do we need to pass the HSR 25, for example, in order? Don't quite follow what he's saying um, there, but I mean, is he saying that we need to go through all of the stuff? I don't so do they, if, if there's a situation in court, do they actually go through the regulations in order? Is that what you're I saying? The investigators would, no, not they in go, order. They'd go to the relevant ones, wouldn't they? No, well, I mean the, the, the person in the person who's doing the expert witness job would would look at what's failed, and depending on how they are, I mean, an expert witness. Yeah, I'll get it now. Never works for the client, even if they are an, ind an independent expert witness working for the prosecution or the defence. They are never actually working for them. They are working for the court at all times. Um, you can put a spin on things, I suppose. You can sugarcoat things. But at the end of the day, you are responsible. Your expert witness work is for the court. It has to be true. It has to be faithful. And it has to be accurate. Matter of fact. Matter of fact. And you can be held in contempt of court or you can be held culpable for your lack of due diligence in an expert witness report. You can end up going to prison or being prosecuted for your incompetence in doing the said report. So, <coughs> so what we would look at is, you know, what's gone wrong? You know, mm. the fire engineers would go in, let's take a consumer unit fire in a dwelling. The fire engineers, the fire investigators would go in, they would look at the seat of the fire. They would do all that analysis. Um, and then they would start putting the report together as an electrical as ex expert. Then they would piece together, sorry, the fire guys would piece together the devices that were in the board. 
the electrical guy then would go back and look at those devices and their performance, the torque settings, gather all that good stuff together, date the sheets, look at the loads on that board, see if the board had been overloaded. Is there a potential for a fault? You know, um, was it a cooker circuit wired in bell wire? Um, you know, was the mm. buzz bar missing the cage clamp and that's <clears> why it overheated? All these sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and, and that's the kind of thing you would put forward to the court. Just, and it just, would be for the prosecution of the health and safety executive more than likely to decide what legislation they're going to prosecute you under. Just, just for clarity and to avoid all doubt, and for this recording, Eddie Clements sleeps very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Eddie's a good guy. No yeah, doubt. Yeah. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, right. No. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. So Afshin Honor Joyan. Uh, forgive me if I've got that pronunciation incorrect. He has stated many electrical lecturers believe the max value for bonding gas or water is 0.05 ohms. Is this correct value? If this is correct, could you please explain? What do we think, oh, boys? That's a podcast in itself. That's guys. a podcast in itself. Aren't we yeah. doing a podcast on this? I'm pretty Didn't sure we're talking about it. it. The short and the long of it is no, it's wrong. Because if you've got a 50 meter long, six millimeter 10 millimeter earth bond you can't you can't you cannot defy the laws of physics captain you know copper's got a got a resistance you know and that's the end of it um yeah there's been a few interpretations of this that have been readdressed because of the fact that there is confusion about this there's some people now saying that it's really just about the resistance of the ec15 clamps connection um, no, we covered when, that in our DNO one, didn't we? Yeah, but yeah. I'm saying what people, the tutors are saying. Oh, sorry, mate. All right, yeah. Me. They're saying it's a resistance of the connection to the EC15 clamp. Some are saying it's just an assumption. Fundamentally, if you're talking about a 10 mil, what's that like? It's about 27 meters or so, you know, of 10 mil. It's, it's, as Paul says, it's the science, you know, just work out resistivity of the measurement, look at ambient temperature, look at the length. It's not hard to work that out to, to determine what the value should be of the resistance of the main of the body. Um, no point, you know, point not five is just a number out of the air at the moment. Where this came from, let's be honest, is the meter actually accurate at that level anyway? Yeah, well, that's a, another thing. <laughs> um, where this basically came from is in Guidance Note 3, a fairly old one. Um, mm. what it said, and this is one I think about 15 years ago, it said, when testing the effectiveness of main equipotential bonding conductors, the resistance value between a service by other extraneous connector bar and the main earthing terminal should be in the order of 0 0.05 ohms or less. It did not say it mm. will be less than 0 0.05. It just said that's the kind of value you're going to get. In other words, a low. very low value because it's yeah. a continuous it, length of conductor. It, yeah. it didn't say between the extraneous conductive part and the main earthing terminal either, did it? You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've actually asked JPEL64 this. I've actually asked a, a gentleman I know who sits on JPEL. And, and, and to be honest, it's one of these things that's got lost in the mists of time a little bit. It's been around for so long mm. that it's kind of, you know, it's a negligible resistance is what you're looking for. Yeah. The but minimum. the thing is, the thing is, you just stated there, Paul, with instrument accuracy, you're talking about random number generators when we get to this low end of the scale. Unless you're using something like, uh, oh, you know. I was going to plug a manufacturer then. Um, okay. What the old ductor testers we used to call them, you know, uh, um, a high current low resistance ohm meter. Yeah. Maybe a digital low resistance high current ohm meter, or, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be digital, not, but. Yeah, we're not in NFTs, though, are they, those? No. No, these are dedicated. We're talking about a two and a half thousand pound instrument here. Yeah. Can I tell you how I was taught? So I, I was taught this 0 0.05, um, well, 50,000 ohms in English money. Um, and I was taught quite a weird and probably different way, but I was literally taught. Um, when it comes to bonding or any sort of conductive surfaces, you would yeah. get your effect for your mega and you would go from an exposed part of the electrical installation to all metal work. And if it was below 50,000 ohms, effectively, you would consider it extraneous. And if it was right, oh, that's no, if it was below 50,000 ohms, it was exposed. And if it was yeah. above 50,000 ohms, it was extraneous. That's that's a test looking at insulation integrity to determine if there's anything between the extraneous and the exposed. Yes. which is where that high value, but this is continuity of one conductor. So we're looking here at very but low was, ohms. Yes, but I, that's, I was taught, again, this is probably wrong, but the tutor who taught, taught me was the 50,000 ohms value was directly proportionate to the 0.05 value of the connection. 
And that's where that came from. That's what I was taught in college. Now, there's no evidence to back any of that up, but it kind of made sense to me at the time. I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see how that works. No, I need to think about it a right. bit more. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll, we'll podcast this, though. I think we'll do one on this. Yeah. I think we've got to do it. 23 kilo ohms test at the moment, or 22 kilo ohms yeah. test. Yeah, that's, 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 and that's based on voltage out at the result, isn't it? Yeah, don't follow my opinion, folks. <laughs> it's, it's a bit rusty. Yeah. I mean, I think the point is that if you're going to be testing a length of conductor, see the sort of length it is. If it's only like a metre long, you're basically looking for pretty much zero. But on the other hand, if it was 50 metres long, you're not going to get 0.05 simply for the fact that it can't be because, as I said earlier, the copper is that certain resistance. So yeah. it is not a question of you will get this value because that cannot possibly apply mm. in all situations. So it's got to be, if it's a certain length, you're looking for the appropriate value to make sure it is in fact continuous and not got breaks or someone's yeah. put a little bit of thin wire in the middle or something. The problem is this random number kind of doesn't equate to anything because it, it's, it doesn't relate to length. It's just one number. And if we were to have the ability to actually create a value to calculate, such as a, a, a voltage presence, so we could try to determine a voltage was no less than X volts, we'd then be able to have a resistance limit to actually determine it. But we don't do that. We just go with one number. And we just assume that that number will fix with any adjustment of length. Yeah. I mean... There is one of the one of the schemes did a, a, a chart. I think one of the technical um, for one of the schemes did a um, they, one of their guys did a quick chart, a quick red rack, and they're saying, look, you know, for this not look for this just to get this across to people for this 0.05 value, you know, these are the limits that your cable can be. You know, just to educate people, saying, look, if it's if cable's longer than this, you're not going to get a 0.05. You just can't get there. You know. Yeah. And yeah. The, the problem with that is that a lot of people, if you actually, if I just had a quick search there, that's been now twisted around. So you've now got people saying things like, oh, if it's more than a certain length, oh, you must use a much bigger conductor. So you must put in 25 millimeter bonding and all the rest of it, which is complete. Junk. That's again, it's just playing with Ohm's law to hit a 0 0.0, a 0.05 yeah. number that we don't know why we're doing it. So it's twisting it around to make, <laughs> make us yeah. some kind of point. But, yeah. 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 And what we should be doing is looking at, well, what's the maximum touch voltage allowable? Well, we did that's that. the whole point. That's the whole point of bonding. You know, you know, in the you know Ohm's law with that is in there. Four one five point two starts to touch on the idea of looking at the voltage that's present. I'm sure, I, we covered touch voltage got, in one of the early podcasts. Yeah, maybe we could do a podcast on this in particular, just to play with some math ideas and see what we can come out with. Yeah. But it's a good question. But the yeah, our, 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 our answer is um, no. Basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, no. we'll give an answer if we can understand the science behind the answer and if it makes sense. And this doesn't, that's a very valid answer, Dave. Um, hmm. on that bombshell, if there's any more questions, speak now for ever hold your peace. Otherwise, I will start to wind this down by thanking David, John, and Paul for joining us on this adventure. Go set some homework, go set some homework, Mr. Betteridge. We'd like some of your efforts to find an answer to this for us as well, because we'd like to see what you can come up with, mate, because we know you've got the earthing stuff. We know that you've got it at hand, mate. I know you're probably already working to... on it already, so that's some homework for you. We'll see you in the Discord and we need one day this on week. Podcast. Yes, and then you can come and deliver the results on the podcast with us. Sounds Indeed. good. Other than that, if there's, if there's not anything else, thank you very much, everybody, for giving us your time. It's appreciated. If these help on YouTube or in live, um, then it's all worth it and um, we'll do more web we've got more webinars on the way yeah. on different stuff, there's, so there's lots of podcasts coming and obviously some stuff that might be a bit larger we will obviously do a podcast first to dry run a webinar because you know there's many things that we do want to have some of you guys coming in interacting yeah. like this i think it's a much better way instead of you know delivering a podcast then us maybe seeing your messages later live like this is very good for some of these subjects and it's a good way to share that yeah. journey of discovery together in a it is. group. It's great. It's also great practice because I think, you know, we're going to do some more of this, especially through the, through the course I of love next year. Skatel. Skatel. Yeah, that's great. Love it. Love it. Skatel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. On that bombshell, I'm going to attempt. <laughs> you can find the, the finish this. button. Yes. I'm right, going to guys. attempt. I'm not guaranteeing now, but thank you very much, everybody. You can all disappear yep. rather than watch my shame and misery of me trying to figure <laughs> out how to stop this thing. So, right. yeah, until the next one. Bye bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. See you. And there we go. Done. Have you done? Well done, yeah. Did you do? Hang on, let's see. Nope, still, no, still, still here. Just, uh, yeah. We're still here. Eddie's still here. <laughs>
Hang on, I've got too many screens open. Uh, it end it for all. End it for all. Where we You'll get this oh, sometime. There we go. Yeah, I found it. Sorry, it's boring the box. See you, mate. Peace and love. Bye-bye. Nice.